All right, you guys, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you guys so much for being here. We're going to have a really good topics today. We're going to get into some more esoteric, occult, metaphysical knowledge, and it's going to be amazing as usual. Guys, listen, what is going on? What is going on in the matrix with Jamie Foxx, y'all? You know how the song says, and they lie and they play in your face, but we got the truth. We got the juice. We got the truth. Okay. Now, in regards to the title of the room today, we're going to get into a book by Manly P. Hall called Initiates of the Flame. Okay. And like I always do when I do the books, it's, um, it's only 90 minutes. Um, hopefully we can get through all of it today because I do stop and, um, you know, basically decode the book as it's going along and do the translation because it is, these are occult books that was written, you know, for a particular group of people. It's not written for the masses. So these books are written in, they're encoded. Okay. Um, this particular book was written in the, in 1922. So it's a very old book. And just like we did the secret teachings of all ages and, um, and, 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 and some other books by him, and I'll continue to do more by him and some other occult, see occult, um, writers, the difference between myself and a lot of other people. Um, I deep, I deal with deep spirituality, things that is going to help you to really transform your life. You understand? Um, because it's going to get you to um, know yourself. Hello, Alistair. Um, it's going to get you to know yourself a lot better. Your your uh, your third eye will continue to open because it's not your third eye opening. There's levels to that, right? There's many levels to that. And a part of that is being able to raise your kundalini energy, okay, to make that, to hit that third eye. So that is done in a gradual way. If it was done in a very instantaneous way, right? Like suddenly, um, your, you know what I'm saying? That part of your, your brain, your spiritual body would not be able to sustain that. So it's a little bit at a time. This is why when people went into these initiation, um, circles and they took many, many years and there's different levels to initiation. So that's the book that we're going to get into today. However, we got to start with the matrix shit that's going on. <laughs> okay. So what the hell is going on with Jamie Foxx? Now, here's what I'll say. They lie and they play in our face. We've been covering this stuff for a very long time now. And I've talked about a lot of these different things for you, you know, old heads that's been with the matrix on veil for since the very beginning, you already know I done put the work down. And so when you notice now, it has become more mainstream for people to be saying that clones exist. But when I was talking about this one and a half years ago, it seemed crazy to a lot of people. I had to bring in the information. I did a whole room on clones. I did a room about Kanye being cloned before they rolled out his actual clone. Kanye got a lot of clones, but this last version is like, that's not him. That's not him. And so I know these things seem to be beyond the realm of reality, but I think we have the most, you know what I'm saying, dynamic case in Jamie Foxx that this is an actual clone. This is the best case that we have had to prove, you know what I'm saying, that the cloning exists, even though we already knew it existed. But more people that are not into the spiritual world, that's not into occult knowledge, that's not, you know, privy to the undertakings of the, you know, the under the goings, the in and outs of the, what happens underneath the surface of, of our, what we perceive reality, basically the mundanians, that's what I call them, right? Those people are even saying that's not Jamie Foxx. All right. So <laughs> let me tap in with Alistair and Stell. What's up, Saffron? What's up, Lena? What's up, Reggie? Hey, shout out to everybody in the audience. I appreciate you guys for always showing up. Lady B, y'all showing up and always supporting the Matrix on Fail. Quan, shout out to everybody down there. But what do you guys think about the Jamie Foxx? Before we get into the book today, that's going to be our little Matrix stuff. I want y'all to come to the stage and let's talk about it. So yes, what do y'all think about um, 
Jamie Foxx and what's going on with him and this new version of Jamie that they have rolled out. Is that him or is it not? No, nah, I want to know where the hell he at. That's what I want to know. All of a sudden, they want to play in our face and he in Chicago and all of a sudden he on boats and shit. Right. I don't think so. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Like me, okay. like me personally, I think Jamie Foxx been dead and gone for a long time, yo. I just feel like the next time they take like a real clear picture of us, it's going to be like something off about him. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? It's just like, it's just well, crazy. Well, they did. They did. I'm going to show y'all that on my YouTube channel. Okay. So make sure y'all come. I'm gonna show you guys that I'm gonna have the pictures, the videos, and we're gonna we're gonna break it down. I'm gonna have some visuals, okay? So we're gonna we're going over to YouTube. We're gonna be back and forth between YouTube and Clubhouse. But back to Jamie Fox. Back to Jamie Fox. That is not him, okay? I don't care what nobody says. But here's the thing: the what's his name? Gucci Man. We know that's not him, okay? We know that's not him, and they try to tell you that that's him. Uh, what's his name? Uh, B.O.B. talked about the cloning center. A lot of different celebrities have broken down and talked about the cloning centers. Okay. So guys, what is it that is taking place? You know, here's what's taking place, especially with the, the advent of, um, AI and technology and things like that. You know, we just saw them do a, a thing with Drake and his younger self handing him a book. And people try to explain, you know, how that happened or whatnot. But the, there's so much technology that's available that we do not know. I think there is an issue, though, when it comes to cloning people. They've cloned the sheep. They've been dealing with cloning ever since um, in the Nazi era, okay, since then. they That's where they started to work on that. What's his name? Joseph Mengele. He was doing the experiments on twins, right? And so that the twins, you know, testing their DNA, doing different things like that. You know, um, this is how they were using to, um, this is some of the techniques that they were using to come to figure out how to make another human being. Well, why would they clone a celebrity, right? Because they're worth a lot of money. They're worth a lot of money. They're, celebrity, you think of that as another human being, but that's an actual product. It's a product. And you have to understand how the elites think. They don't think in the ways of humanity and what you think is your humanity is they don't think that way. So Jamie is a brand, he's multi-talented. And so at a certain point, okay, so here's as, as two things are happening. At a certain point, you know, if they go the route of selling their soul or whatnot for fame and, you know, riches and talents, they that's that has a time limit on it. They have to, you know, do a sacrifice or they become the sacrifice. Several months now that this has been going on and they they never came out and said that something happened to Jamie and they could have come out and said, you know, Jamie got sick and, and they, they, you know what I'm saying? They didn't want to say he died. What they're trying to do is find a replacement for Jamie. I know that there's a lot of speculation going on around it. Him doing this movie, they clone Tyrone. I cannot wait to see it. I'm definitely going to be doing a movie night for the Patreon members for that one. We're going to be watching that together so we can decode it together. Um, but when it comes to Jamie Foxx, this new individual that they put up, and I have a closer photo of it, that's not him. Somebody said that's Jamie Foxx worthy. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's somebody else, but that is not Jamie. So you guys want to chime in? Go ahead, Stell, if you wanted to speak. Okay. Anyone else want to chime in on that? Style, did you unmute your mic? I thought I saw you. Yeah, I was just about to say, I'm still trying to feel the, the Jamie Foxx situation out because I definitely know something doesn't feel right whatsoever. But I, it, it, clearly, the, the picture I saw of him in Chicago didn't look like him in Chicago on a boat in the middle of July. Mm -mm. And then why are his photos so far away? Why are they so grainy and blurry? You know what I mean? And even the one they had him playing some type of other game, it's like they're testing out the clone. They're slowly trying to introduce the clone to you. So because basically you're going to be gaslit, all of us, right, into thinking where we that that is him when we can clearly see that's not him. And the thing is that is catching on in more mainstream because this is a bad clone of Jamie. This is a really really bad clone of him. So the whole Jamie Fox situation, guys, is a big ass ritual okay it's a big ass ritual just like that white party that michael rubin just had 
in the Hamptons where Jay-Z and Beyonce was present. Did you guys see all those photographs of all everything that was going on with them? All that hugging up, you know what I'm saying? With all like literally it the, the, the all the male rappers and athletes and that guy, Damon Hammond, I think is his name. That just, you know, he fell down on the football field. Remember that, you guys? You know what I'm saying? And they were, you know, they were dying. Things are happening. And then all of a sudden, he shows back up. So is he a clone? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Is he a clone? And then he shows up. What? Why would he be in an elite circle as just a football player, guys? Make it make sense. It doesn't make any sense. So just stay aware and um stay cognizant of the things that are taking place in the matrix and the tricks that are going on because they're coming hot they're coming hot and they're coming in heavy um and they're not even hiding this stuff anymore at this point you know what i'm saying that's just how much they're playing in your face but the flip side to that is you know you have to continue to do your studies be aware of you know like i always say be the observer in the matrix right just like in um you know, the, the times of the beginnings of this particular current reality that we are aware of, we've got the watchers, we've got the, you know what I'm saying, the, those are the observers, they watch society, you know, they don't actually participate in it, but they look and see everything that we're doing. You have to become a watcher, you have to become an observer. So these are things to just follow in your mind, not to overly get emotional about or whatnot, but just know that it's real. So if they can clone a person you know what i'm saying who are we safe so these are things that you should know when you're going to your doctor you know when you're giving out blood giving out samples of your dna for whatever reasons you know what i mean the capability of these powerful people on the planet right uh, they don't think the way that we think no one is safe you know what i'm saying think about safety for yourself for your family members your children things like that because they're really just snatching up people, okay? And the, these celebrities, I don't even think Beyonce is Beyonce, to be honest with you, but I think it's a demon they got in her body. <laughs> and I do believe, and I done broke that down, how that works and, you know what I'm saying, what the, how they can bring that, how they can even put that demon in the soul, in, in the child in the womb. So um, to take the soul and put a demon in there so the demon can live out a whole full life on the earth. We talked about that. We talked about the astral plane. If you guys miss those, you know, rooms, they're on Patreon. Okay. So with that being said, guys, we're going to go ahead. That's just any comments on the, the mundanian, you know, files today. <laughs> That's what I'm going to start calling the mundanian files. Anything that y'all want to mention before we get into the, um, the esoteric teachings today, the initiates of the flame by Manly P. Hall. All right, then let's get into it. So I'm going to be playing a book. It's about 90 minutes long but I will be um, interrupting to do the breakdown of the book, okay? Initiates of the Flame. The purpose of research is for these were published in 1922 by the Philosophical Research Society. I will be reading the updated third edition, released in 1934. As a general disclaimer, the views and opinions expressed in this book belong to the author and may not always reflect those of Master Key Society or its affiliates. This recording is a production of Master Key Society for the purpose of research, study, and discussion. Preface. The Initiates of the Flame was my first literary effort, and it is indeed gratifying that through the years it has been out of print, a demand sufficient to justify its republication should have persisted. It is therefore again presented to the public entirely re-illustrated and with considerable editorial revision. Twelve years have passed since the first publication of this little work on mystical symbolism. During this interim, I have considerably extended the scope of my researches into the subject matter of which the work treats. However, in reviewing the book today, I do not feel moved to make any change in the basic viewpoints set forth. The Initiates of the Flame is a little essay on the mystery of fire. To all ancient peoples, fire was a symbol of the Divine One dwelling in the innermost parts of all things. Robert Flood, a Rosicrucian mystic, writing in the 17th century, declared that the fire of the philosophers was divided into three parts. First, 
a visible fire, which is the source of physical light and heat. Second, an invisible or astral fire, which enlightens and warms the soul. Third, a spiritual or divine fire, which in the universe is known as God and in man as spirit. That's your kundalini energy. And let me tell you guys there's something, right? If you understand mythology, which you should, you should get more into mythology. I really promote that a lot. But um, the whole life, there would be no life in man without fire. Okay. And so the myth, the myth is that Prometheus, the gods were angry with Prometheus, Prometheus because Prometheus stole fire from the gods. The fire is a sign of life fire from the gods and gave it to humans and with the fire they were able to progress right so the dumbed down human that was um created by these gods to, to serve the gods fire is was the first technology that man ever received because with fire he could do so much but that is the physical fire and so as you can see there's a threefold um, meaning of fire so it's like mind body and spirit all of that the initiates who took their oaths in the presence of the flame renounced the lesser concerns of ordinary life and freed from the attachments of this material sphere these purified souls became custodians of that symbolic flame of wisdom which is the true light of the world the key word there being custodian if you're a custodian you're not the owner okay so understand that even when they're speaking about the fire and the flame, and as you'll get more into the book, it will become more apparent. The key thing to understand here is that the, the, the keepers of this knowledge that have it in our current day, these are not the owners of it. They were left to be the custodians of it, to keep it while a certain the, the gods went to sleep. So now the gods, it's time for the gods to reawaken and the gods must take back their knowledge. This is the knowledge of the gods okay that went to sleep and if you are god on earth you'll know what i'm talking about okay this is not for everybody these are the these are the custodians of the flame we are the flame if you are a divine etheric being that came from the cosmic realm then you are the fire you are the fire how is the how is that how is that because it is your kundalini energy these people do not have that it's the people that um that that are the custodians of this knowledge they're trying to figure out how to become that thing that the fire resides within so this is the reason why when you're studying like um when i first started studying about like yoga and kundalini energy and things like that there was all these warnings oh you, you know if you raise your kundalini energy up it's very dangerous and you need no it's not it's not it's really not dangerous at all but it's dangerous because the kundalini is tied into your soul Right, that's the whole mechanism of your um, your physical body, but also your spiritual body. Right, it's the the connection between your pineal gland, your pituitary gland, and um, your uh, hypothalamus. Okay, so that's a threefold path. That is a triangle in your brain. That's what the kundalini energy raises up from. It's like the fire is the god, and when you're on Earth the fire resides in your root chakra, okay? So it's diminished. So when you raise the flame up, that is you building up your spiritual body incrementally over time. So when you experience death or transition, that Kundalini should activate in the sense where your spiritual body becomes activated so you're able to travel on to the next realm, to the next thing that you're supposed to be doing outside of earth, and not being reincarnated. I'm gonna try not to talk so long and too much in between the book, but um, I do want to expand upon these topics because you know you can read the book on your own. That's why I'm here um, playing the book so I can break these things down and expand upon what is being said. Okay, let's continue. This light is a manifestation of the one universal life, that active agent whose impulses are the cause of all sidereal phenomena. Where in antiquity this flame of light, this spirit fire, was the object of a universal adoration and was worshipped as the very presence of God himself, it now lies buried beneath the ruins of man's fallen temple. 
obscured by the paramount interests of the flesh, it emits but the faintest gleam in this non-philosophic age. Manley Hall The Initiates of the Flame Introduction Few realize that at the present stage of civilization, there are illumined souls who walk the earth, like the priests of the ancient temples, watching and guarding the sacred fires that burn upon the altar of humanity. They are the purified ones, who have renounced the life of this sphere in order to guard and protect the flame, that spiritual principle in man now hidden beneath the ruins of his fallen temple. The mysteries of antiquity have seemingly picked. What is the ruins of his fallen temple? Anybody could tell me? Why well, there's nobody on the stage? <laughs> but the ruins of the fallen temple would be um, your root chakra. Okay, that would be the ruins of your fallen temple, because everything that you were as a higher level being, um, when you fell into this physical third dimension, that that's where the fire uh, uh, resides. The fall, the ruins. That's the ruins. Because you're only thinking about survival, right? You're not thinking about anything spiritual in your root chakra. Perished. The faith, however, of the golden age, the first religion of man, can never wholly die. As we think of the nations that are gone, of Greece and Rome, and the grandeur that was Egypt's, we sigh as we recall the story of their fall. And we watch the nations of today, wondering which will be the next to draw its shroud about itself and join that great ghostly file of peoples that are dead. But everywhere, even in the rise and fall of nations, we see through the haze of materiality the figure of justice. Everywhere we see the principle of fulfillment. The altar of the everlasting one is lifted up in the midst of the world. A great hand reaches out from the unseen and regulates the affairs of man. It reaches out from that great spiritual flame which nourishes all created things. The never-dying fire that burns on the sacred altar of cosmos. That great fire which is the spirit of God. If we turn again to the races now dead, we shall discover the cause of their destruction. The light had gone out. Mm. Who do y'all think are the races now dead that their lights have gone out? They're speaking about the fallen gods because he just told you, like I told you, that the, um, the, the flame represents God. That is you and your etheric realm, the etheric as an etheric being. And so your light has gone out. You have fallen, right? These are the dead. Let me rewind that real quick. If we turn again to the races now dead, the races now dead, we shall discover the cause of their destruction. We shall discover the cause of their destruction. I need you to listen to this, you guys. Please listen. The light had gone out. When the flame within the body is withdrawn, the body dies. When the light was taken from the altar, the temple no longer was the dwelling place of a living God. Degeneracy, lust and greed, hates and fears crept into the souls of ancient Greece and Rome, and black magic overshadowed Egypt. The light upon the altar grew weaker and weaker. The priests lost the word. Okay, let me translate this. Um, you know, and guys, if you, you know, the more interaction that I could get, then the more I can explain and break this stuff down to you guys. But he says in Greece and um, Rome, but there was a fall even before then, okay? They're only writing this information and applying it to themselves based upon the knowledge that they found when they came into these positions of power in Greece and Rome. So this, what they're talking about, yes, that happened, but they were not the gods that fell. You understand? The gods that fell came before Greece and Rome. We're talking about Samaria. We're talking about Atlantis. We're talking about Lemuria because that's when the real true gods walked upon the earth that end up going to sleep and going into ruin, into this physical and find themselves into slavery. 
right? Displaced, not knowing who they were, forgetting. And so these individuals in Greece and Rome let, got the text that they left behind and they became the custodians of that, all right? So understand this, before our current rulers came to power, that they've not been ruling for about 6,000 years, before they came to power, that um, there were the fallen based upon the things that he's saying right now. Greed, lust, you know, things like that of a lower nature. Because what starts to happen when the vibratory rate on the planet starts to shift, everyone started to become more human. And to be human is to have these five, only five senses where we had many different senses that had nothing to do with the five basic ones that we utilize to navigate, you know, this third dimension. So understand that this flame that he's speaking about, he's speaking about the gods, not the Greeks and the Romans, but that what came before them, but they're gonna apply this stuff because that's as far back as they can go. The current rulers, they've been ruling with your, the knowledge of the ancients, which they came before them, okay? The name of the flame. Little by little, the flame flickered out. And as the last spark grew cold, a once mighty nation was extinguished, buried beneath the dead ashes of its own spiritual fire. But the flame did not die. Like spirit, of which it is the essence, it cannot die because it is life, and life cannot cease to be. Hello. What is another thing that is coming to your mind about the flame? That it can it just went dim it diminished. That's you. Okay. Is the flame could also be called dark matter energy. This is what they're trying to figure out. The flame is your source of immortality. This is what it's saying that the flame cannot die. It's just diminished, which is in it's, it resides at the base of your spine, right? And that could get a lot more in detail and complicated when you're dealing with, you know, the 33 vertebrae, the staff of Tahuti, the two snakes that enter, you know, twine going around the base of your spine. The flame that sits at the top of that particular image, this is your Kundalini image, this is your soul. Okay. So it never dies. This is a form of your immortality. So if you do not have that particular flame in you, you do not have immortality. But if you do, then, you know what I'm saying, you, you may re get recycled back here onto the earth. However, doing the proper spiritual work as you are doing, then um, you are going to be able to access this. So when it's, you know, become the flame again, the fully evolved flame, that is your God self. In some wilderness of land or sea, it rested once more. And there again arose a mighty nation around that flame. So history goes on down through the ages. As long as people are true to the flame, it remains. But when they cease to nourish it with their lives, it passes on to other lands and other worlds. The worshippers of this flame are now called heathens. Little do we realize that we ourselves are heathens, until we are baptized of the Holy Spirit, which is fire. For fire is light, and the children of the flame are sons of light, even as God is light. Did y'all catch that, that, that contradiction that he just said? He said those that believed in the flame were considered heathens. But they couldn't, like, you know what I'm saying? Then he said that... Um, the only way to not become a heathen is become being baptized by the damn flame. Like he just contradicted himself. And this is a lot you have, how you learn how to read these um, ancient texts because they do have a lot of contradictions and blinds on purpose. Okay. And some of it, it was just them not having all of the knowledge and did not know how to completely fully translate the knowledge. So they just translated based upon their own, you know, um, belief system or what they wanted the translation to be. But you heard what he said. There are those who, for ages, have labored with man to help him kindle within himself this spark, which is his divine birthright. Okay, now I'm, I'm stop pa pausing. I'm, I promise I'm gonna try. But the spark, this divine spark, is very important for you guys to know, because on the tree of life and study Kabbalah, um, at the very top, before anything comes into existence, the very first spear which is the beginning of the formation of the matrix, what happens is that 
Kether, which is the first spear that comes of the first emanation, basically, um, they're said that that's where the divine spark comes from. Now, that divine spark travels down the um, the tree of life into all the other, the nine other spears. So it goes over to the right, the left. So it's called a lightning bolt. That's the spark. But this is the human, the, 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 the fire, the human soul going down into basically where we are into Malkuth. So this is how this whole world is structured. It's all about the souls. It's all about the souls. That's why they're soul selling and, you know what I'm saying, all this type of stuff, things to make you, you know, even if you're not signing into a contract to get rid of your soul, um, you know, you do things to compromise your inner, your inner beingness. And that is also a form of selling out or selling, getting rid of your soul when you do all types of immoral acts for money or for personal, you know, gain, things that be, can be harmful to others and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's all about the souls and that's the divine spark. And it is, if you are an immortal, it is your divine right and you're born with it. So it doesn't matter what your profession is right now. It doesn't matter your station in life. That's not what that is. It is what, who you are as your cosmic origin. Okay. And everyone does not have a cosmic origin. So for you that have, I don't care what trials and tribulations that you have been through. If you know yourself to know this. And you can capture and reawaken this knowledge inside of yourself, then you can determine if you have that divine spark. But everyone does not have it. Melanated beings, for the most part, they have it if they still have kept it throughout the, you know, generations or whatnot. These are the ones who, by their lives of self sacrifice and service, have awakened and tended this fire, who, through ages of study, have learned the mystery it contains and whom we now call the initiates of the flame. That would be all of us in this room. For ages, they have labored with mankind to help him uncover the light within himself. And on the pages of history, they have left their seal, the seal of fire. Unhonored and unsung, they have labored with humanity. And now the stories of their lives are used as fairy tales to amuse children. The time will come, however, when the world will know the work they did and realize that our present civilization is raised upon the shoulders of the mighty demigods of the past. Like Faust, we stand with all our lore, fools no wiser than before, because we reject the truths they taught and the evidence of their experiences. Let us honor these sons of the flame, not by words, but by living so that their sacrifice shall not be in vain. They have shown us the way. They have led man to the gateway of the unknown, and then in their robes of glory passed behind the veil. Their lives were the keys to their wisdom, as they must ever be. Though long ago they passed beyond, they still live in history, beacons on the path of human progress. Let us watch these mighty ones as silently they pass by. First, Orpheus, playing upon the seven-stringed lyre of his own being, the music of the spheres. The seven-stringed uh, um, lyre of his own instrument, or whatever he just said, that's a reference to the, um, the seven shockers. Okay, I'm going to rewind that so we can hear that again. Upon the seven-stringed lyre of his own being, the music. The seven-stringed lyre of his own being. That's his, his own being would be his body. The seven strings of the um, instrument would be the seven chakras. Of the spheres. Then Hermes, the thrice greatest, with his emerald tablet of divine revelation. Through the shades of the past, we dimly see Krishna, the illuminated, who on the battlefield of life taught man the mysteries of his own soul. Next, we see the sublime Buddha, his yellow robe not half so glorious as the heart it covers. And our own dear master, the man Jesus, his head surrounded with a halo of golden flame and his brow serene with the calm of mastery. Okay, I'm gonna pause it right there again because he mentioned Jesus. So he mentioned Jesus along with these other characters, right? And so that should let you know that 
Jesus was not in because they don't make you worship Buddha. They don't make you worship Hermes, Trismegistus. They don't ma make you worship Orpheus, right? So all of these um, are symbolic symbolisms of your highest spiritual attainment. It's, it's a title, right? Um, you in your highest form could become the Buddha or become the Hermes Trismegistus, right? Or you could become the Christ, the Christos. That's all that it means. And so this to me is further proof that, you know, um, the deification of this one figure called Jesus is, is definitely misguided. That's not how we have been taught to worship him as a God. It's not true. This is an element, an aspect of yourself as well as all of these other deities that he just um, mentioned. Then Muhammad, Zoroaster, Confucius, Odin, Moses, and others no less worthy passed before the inner eye of the student. They were the sons of the flame. From the flame they came, and to the flame they have returned. I wonder where the daughters of the flame are. I'm just asking, you know what I'm saying? But to the flame they came, and from the flame they will return. This is, um, you know, your bodies were not meant to be placed in the ground. That's even a ritual, six feet under. Six being the number of man, the six, the six, and the six, you know, three protons, six protons, six new, um, neutrons, six electrons. That's the six, six, six is the number of the man. Intrinsically, it's not bad because if you flip that six over, you're going to get the number nine. Nine represents the number of completion. Okay. That means that you have did the work or, you know what I'm saying? Your time has expired here. So, but it's twisted. You, you, you were supposed to come, you said from ashes to ashes, dust to dust from the ash that you came into formation as a physical being, when you transpire, you should return back to the ash and that you're not, you're not supposed to be six feet under the ground, um, pushing up daisies and letting your bones go to rot. You're supposed to return to the flame through, you know, in the elder, you know, elder cultures, they would, you know, have a burning ceremony. Now they call it cremation, but that they, the ancients knew that the only time that they did the burial rites was because they were, you know, of the royal, you know, class and they had a lot of knowledge, you know, before they actually fell, fell, fell like we are now. And they knew how to reincarnate back into those same bodies. Okay. With the same station in life and all of that, they knew how to do that. We don't have that. We don't have that type of knowledge. So you're not supposed to be getting buried like that. This was for pharaohs. To us, they beckon, bidding us join them in the service of the flame they love. They were without creed or clan. They served but the one great ideal. From a common source they came, to a common place they have returned. No superiority was theirs, but hand in hand they labored for humanity. Each loves the other, for the power that has made them masters has also shown them the brotherhood of all life. In the pages that follow, we shall try to show this great thread, the spiritual thread of living fire that winds in and out through all religions and binds them together with mutual ideals and mutual needs. In the story of the Holy Grail and the legends of King Arthur, we find that thread wound around the table of the king and the temple of Mount Salvart. This same thread of fire that passes through the roses of the Rosicrucians is entwined about the petals of the lotus and around the temple pillars of Luxor. There is but one religion in all the world, and that is the worship of God, the spiritual flame of the universe. Under many names he is known in all lands, but whether as Ishwar or Ammon or God, he is ever the same, the creator of the universe, and fire is his universal symbol. Now, we are the flame-born sons of... Okay, so when he talks about that, I think it's important for us to remember that, you know, we, the God that sits over this particular matrix is not God. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's like we have the divine realm outside of this particular matrix, which is the tree of life. It depicts the whole matrix structure. 
The God that sits over that is called the Demiurge and it is a masculine energy, but the divine creator that, you know what I'm saying, that is of the, the Pleroma, which is of the nothingness, right? That is a feminine energy. The all is a feminine energy, okay? So in the feminine energy, the masculine is, is um, comprised in that as well. But when that separated and created this universe, and you can go read the, um, the Gnostic thoughts about um, Sophia, the great mother, Sophia, which represents wisdom, that's what that means, and her son, Yadaboth, who is known as the Demiurge, okay? And he created the seven planets, you know, this, that, and the third, which is the, um, the archons, okay? And this is where you get your astrology from, you get the different planets, and it gets a lot, a lot deeper than that. But just for a little bit of a reference, I wanted to point that out, that when they're talking about in these occult texts, you know, their, you know, current rendition of it, or even when they were accessing this knowledge, they worship the Demiurge. And that is not the God that you're supposed to be even tapping into. You're really tapping into yourself as God if you have the cosmic um, origin, okay? Because your cosmic origin goes beyond that. You're not supposed to be trapped down here in a meat suit. You You come to have this experience, but you have to also know how to you know what I'm saying? Get out of here when the time has come. What's up, AJ? <laughs> What's going Hello. on? Bro? I'm in here teaching child, just um doing this book. I ain't been on Clubhouse in two weeks. But we we're going through this Manly P Hall book right now. It's only um an hour and a half. So but I mean I don't think we even been through 15 minutes because I keep stopping and breaking the book down. But that's what the book is. You know, that's what I do. I, I break things down. So we're gonna continue. God thrown off as sparks from the wheels of the infinite. Around this flame, we have built forms which have hidden our light. But as students, we are increasing this light by love and service until it shall again proclaim us sons of the eternal. Within us burns that flame, and before its altar, the lower man must bow, a faithful servant of the higher, when man serves the flame, he grows, and the light also grows, until finally he takes his place with the true initiates of the universe, those who have given all to the infinite in the name of the flame within. Let us, therefore, seek this flame and also serve it, realizing that it is in all created things, that all are one because all are parts of that eternal flame the fire of spirit, the life and power of the universe. Upon the altar of this flame, the writer offers this book and dedicates it to that one fire which blazes forth from God and which is now hidden within each living thing. You heard it? God is within you. In other words, you are God, okay? Forward the greatest of mystery schools. The world is the schoolroom of God. Our being in school does not make us learn, but- Did y'all hear this? Now, you know, you gotta tap into these older texts because when I say earth is a school, right? It's something that I intuited on my own just from my own observations and just through my lived experiences you know, uh, my darkness path, my light path, just being here and really digging into myself and as a study, studying myself, studying the occult. And I'm like, you know, just trying to find meaning in life. I already came up with that, that l life is a school, right? Earth is a school. And I have like different um, analogies to go along with that. But here, this book was written in 1922 and they're telling you, that this is a school because now nah, if it was written in 1922 understand this knowledge came before this right they just access the knowledge and so here it is written in the pages that this earth is a school you're not here to be just living a mundane life okay that that is a sheep you know what i'm saying that you're not here to just live a mundane life yes enjoy the beauties of this world right but there's more work to be done than that 
simultaneously you have to do the spiritual work it's like being in class and all you do is clown all day that's it and you fail in grade after grade after grade and so you have to repeat the grade repeating the grade is like reincarnation okay so the thing is this is a school you do not you're not supposed to come here and just have fun have fun you could do all of the things but do not negate and um, neglect your spiritual work, the great work that you're supposed to be doing here, because it's much deeper than that. We watched the great, um, we watched um, recently on, 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 in Patreon, we watched uh, What Dreams May Come, which speaks about the afterlife. Your afterlife is just as important. This is not the only life that exists, because if you think this is the only life that exists, you're going to be coming back here over and over and over again. So live this life and make it great. But believe it or not, when you tap into the higher spiritual knowledge, it makes your life, the experience that you have here, even greater. So it's a win-win situation, okay? Because you develop your power in the in the matrix, but you also know that when it is time for it, will be time for all of us inevitably to transition, okay? You will still transition with the knowledge, and then you will have a choice. On when when you experience death, you will have a choice. You and the choice will be your own to make versus you not knowing what to do and then you come back here and you had a rough life and life just kicked your ass and whatnot when you develop these spiritual powers and you this knowing when you go on the other side and you have mastered the matrix you can decide if you want to come back or not that's what the ancients the pharaohs you know what i'm saying they were doing they could decide if they wanted to come back because they had mastered this world and they mastered the world afterwards okay you don't want to just keep coming back and don't know because this is a school. Let me rewind that and let's go. Room of God. Our being in school does not make us learn, but within it is the opportunity for all learning. This school has its grades and its classes, its sciences and its arts, and admission to it is the birthright of man. Mm. Its graduates are its teachers, and its pupils are all created things. Its examples are found in nature, and its rules are God's laws. Those who would be matriculated into the higher colleges and universities must first, day by day and year by year, work through the common school of life and present to their new teachers the diplomas they have won. Upon this diploma is written the name that none may read save those who have received it. Yo, this is so deep, y'all. Because think about it. He's breaking down basically the example that I was intuitively using based upon my own, you know, experiences and my coming to my own understanding that that imagine that there are 360 degrees in a circle and you got one degree because you went to college and you think you're hot shit because of it, right? You're not mastering nothing with that. That's a school. And that is you, even with that one degree, that's one degree. I'm not saying not to get the degrees. I'm not saying that. That's not what I'm saying, guys. But what I am just trying to draw some relevance and to give a different perspective on you think it's hot shit. You can even have three and four degrees, but that's still three and four degrees out of 360. See, the ancients taught taught 360 degrees of knowledge. So if you're not the most, the best degrees that you can have is your spiritual degrees and nobody can initiate you into that. A lot of systems try to do that and that exists, but the best path to self is self-initiation through study, through language. And the spirit will tell you because the spirit told me all this stuff is in this book and I'm listening to this book for the first time with you guys, okay? I'm listening to, to it for the first time with you guys. So just understand the math, the degrees, they are, you know, you only can get a degree. Imagine that there's 360 degrees and you got a degree. How much knowledge that you do not have. You have enough knowledge to function and to be a part of this matrix and to do their bidding, but you do not have true knowledge. True knowledge is never gonna be taught to you in any institution. That true knowledge has to come from the flame within inside of yourself is your own inner seeking and doing what we're doing today and much more than that as well but this is a pathway this is a start to you know everything that you need to be um doing and so once you become activated through the study through applying yourself then 
the path will just be, you know, it will appear to you one by one, whatever paths, as many paths, but those paths will appear because now you're on a spiritual initiation. You're going through the world um, and you're going through a school, but you're not going through the school of the world. You're going through the school of the spirit. And that is very, 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 in, um, uh, you know, it's, it's very much, it's needed. You have to be doing this. Okay. So I hope you guys are enjoying this book because it's already great. I know I'm having fun with it. I love it so far. The hours may seem long and the teachers cruel, but each of us must walk the path and the only ones qualified to go onward are those who have passed through the gateway of experience. Mm -hmm. God's great school for man. Oh. Bars. The fire upon the altar. Mm -mm -mm. Let me tell you something, guys. The name of this book is called Initius of the Flame. It is on YouTube. Okay. I want everybody that's here to go. This is easy. You don't even have to read because I know a lot of y'all don't like reading. Okay. It's being author. It, you know what I'm saying? It's being said to you. So just, I want you to go back and listen to this book again. Take some notes, slow it down and allow it. Maybe maybe even listen to it while you go to sleep. So the, me the, the messages can go into your subconscious mind. Because you don't have to hear it um, with your uh, your mind, your your conscious mind, your subconscious. So going to sleep with something like this would be a great thing as well. He just those was bars upon bars upon bars. As far back as our history goes, we find that fire has played the most important role in the religious ceremonials of the human race. Mm -hmm. In practically every religion, we find the sacred altar fires which were guarded by the priests and vestals with greater care than their own lives. In the Bible, we find many references made to the sacred fires used as one form of devotion by the ancient Israelites. The altar of burnt offerings is as old as the human race and dates from the time when primordial man, lifting himself out of the mists of ancient Lemuria, first saw the sun. Yo! Hold on. Did y'all hear what he just said? Ancient man lifted himself out of the of the dust of where? Ancient Lemuria. Okay. And so there's not a lot of, they got the, the information on Lemuria, but they won't put it out. They have the information on Atlantis. So we'll get some stuff on Atlantis and still not the full, because the Atlantis was a takedown of Lemuria and they won't tell you that. Okay. But this is when the, the, the war in heaven came to earth, was between the Lemurian period and the Atlantean period, okay? When these, these, these warlike beings, which were the, we call them the Anunnaki, sh showed up on the earth, as well as, um, you know, this, these, these beings from Mars or whatnot. So I'm gonna rewind that because that is worth listening to again. Lemuria is the first society, not even say society, but let's say something the closest we, we could think about to that we know about in this particular, you know, age or epoch or whatnot. Lemuria was the first beginnings of man, but we were not in physical form. We were still yet in one body. We had not experienced the fall yet when we were in Lemuria. And this was a aquatic civilization even before the atlanteans we know atlantis right and atlanteans to be a waterborne civilization we're returning to that that's why the seas are acting up right now the, you know what i'm saying all the stuff going on around the seas a lot of activity going on around the seas okay and we definitely going to do a ritual um on my retreat on uh, the matrix on is having a retreat on the 25th of august there's only one slot left um and I only have you only have a couple of days if you want to join that. If you do are interested, you can click the link and go look at the details. It's right at the top of my digital business card. The um the details are there for that. Um, but this, the Atlanteans came after the the Lemurians. Okay, and so that's um it's also known as Mu M U, like the Matrix unveiled. It was known as Mu, and this is where we were superhumans. Um, when we could do telepathy, we had a different light spectrum. The whole thing was different. So I, while I do not have a lot of writings that I've studied about it, it I have intuited it 
and I've seen this place in my mind, in my dreams, I know that it exists and it exists and it still exists to this day. It's just not in this realm. Okay. So I'm going to hit the, the back button on that real quick and we're going to listen to that and keep going. We listen. Self out of the mists of ancient Lemuria mm -hmm. first saw the sun, the great fire spirit of the universe. Among the followers of Zoroaster, the Persian initiate. So let me ask y'all this. If the flame is the key to life, it's the soul, it's God, and it's the sun. Because in order for this earth to be, there had to be a sun. The sun is the soul of the earth, in a sense, right? That's what I'm hearing. And if you can't take the sun, dot, dot, dot. Fire has been used for centuries in honor of the great fire god. Ormuz, who is said by them to have created the universe. There are two parts or divisions of humanity whose history is closely related to that of the wisdom teachings. They embody the doctrines of fire and water, the two opposites of nature. Those who follow the path of faith or the heart use water and are known as the sons of Seth. Mm -hmm. While those who follow the path of the mind and action are the sons of Cain, mm. who was the son of Samael, the spirit of fire. Today mm. I think I need to rewind that. Hold on, guys. Because we, we, we're studying. We're not just listening to the book. We're studying. I know I'm pausing a lot, but it's necessary. Let's listen to that again, okay? Because um, he said Cain, but he didn't say Abel. He said Set. So who was Set? Set was the brother of Osiris, right? So that that was it was um I it was Osiris and his brother Set. Set was supposed to be like the dark one, and Osiris was the light one. So you know Set was the first origin of when whatever we even they started to make a quote unquote devil. He was the bad guy, right? Um, so it's interesting. They said he was of the water. So let me let let's just listen to that again. Who was the son of the path of the mind and action are the sons of Cain. Who was the son of the path of the martyr? Those who follow the water and of the wisdom teachings. They embody the doctrines of fire and water. Fire and water. The two opposites of nature. Okay. So fire and water, the two opposites of nature. Okay. Because what? Water can put out fire. So let's listen to how they're using it. So he's not using Cain and Abel. He's using Set, which is of one pantheon, and then Abel, which is of the Christian pantheon. So it's interesting that he put those two together because um, Set definitely had his opposite, which was his brother Osiris. Cain definitely had his opposite, which is was his brother um, Abel. So it's interesting that he's you know doing this comparison juxtaposition with these two beings from a, you know, different time periods. Those who follow the path of faith or the heart use water and are known as the sons of Seth. Mm. Y'all hear that? Remember now, Seth was the devil. They may set the devil, y'all, okay? But they're saying that those who follow the path of the sun and the heart were the ones of the water, were the ones of the water. And that was set. While those who follow the path of the mind. I'm sorry, somebody trying to say something? Yeah, is he saying set or set? S -E it's set. It's S-E-T and S-E-T-H. It's the same being, Seth. So in modern day, they call it Seth. But in the ancients, he was set, S-E-T. Okay, so that's, that's supposedly um, uh, Adam and Eve, third son, Seth and Seth. In the oh. biblical stuff, yeah. Okay, really? I didn't know much about the Bible. <laughs> so, okay. So, yeah, so set. Yes, Seth, set. Mm -hmm. So, a set, set Typhon. Um, it was set, then set Typhon the, from the Typhonians. Okay, so this was the pre dynast This is pre Egyptian. Um, this was pre Egyptian, where this, this is where the whole concept of the devil with the horns and all of that, even the depiction of um, Horus with the uh, with the, the set on his back, this black image, and said, get thee behind me, Satan. Set was the first image of Satan that they began to 
put into our, you know, into our literally literary um, fields and everything like that. So that's what they made set the first devil, basically. That's the, that the devil was created. This is a whole created being. So they had the demiurge, so they have to have a devil, and they made set the devil. And Achan are the sons of Cain, who was the son of Samael, the spirit of fire. Today we find the latter among the... So Samael is Samael. That's S-A-M-A-E-L. So that's Samuel, right? So just for context. Alchemists, the Hermetic philosophers, the Rosicrucians, and the Freemasons. It is well to understand that we ourselves are the cube altar upon which and in which burns the altar fire. Did he say the cube altar? Hello? <laughs> yeah, I better go back and check out the Matrix cube. Mm -hmm. The Saturn. Did he just say the cube altar? Yep. Hmm. Okay. I'm just making sure. For many centuries, the initiate of fire has been nourishing and guarding the spiritual flame within himself. And so let me tell you something, you guys. I'm, I'm going to rewind that real quick, but let me tell you all this. This is the reason why it's important to set up your altars, okay? If you are in uh, my Patreon, I put up a, um, a link to Walmart where you the altars that I use, the, the, the tables that I use to create an altar, it's a black cube, and it's like 20 bucks, and you just screw the... um you know, the legs and you don't even need, no, it's like two minutes and it's done. Right. And you have a, a perfect altar, but it is black. And for some reason, I've always been drawn to this particular altar. And I use this for all of my all. Sorry about that. You guys, my phone was ringing, but I use this for all of my altars. And it's, I, I like the fact that it's black because the black represents a primordial rum and it is a cube. Okay. It is definitely a cube. And so if y'all, understood and did listen to my rooms on the um saturn cube matrix and how this is it's a, the, the cube is actually a portal so when you put the flame and you do candle magic upon this altar you can pierce through the veil okay you can pierce through the veil the cube the, the not the cube the um the the altar is is um a portal you begin to build a portal the more work that you do on upon your altars okay because it alters your subconscious mind but it also alters reality because you're putting that energies into it to do that that's why they are so important so check it out burns the altar fire for many centuries the initiate of fire has been nourishing and guarding the spiritual flame within himself mm -hmm. as day and night the ancient priests tended the altar fires of Vesta's temple. Know that the flame that burns within you and lights your way is the ever-burning lamp of the ancients. As their lamps were fed by the purest of oil, so your spiritual flame must be fed by a life of purity and altruism. The ever-burning lamp of the alchemist, which burned for thousands of years without fuel in the catacombs of Rome, is but a symbol of this same spiritual fire within himself, which was carried by the initiate in his wandering. It represents the spinal column of man, mm -hmm. at the top of which is flickering a little blue and red flame. As the lamp of the ancients was fed and kept burning by the purest of olive oil, so man is transmuting within himself and cleansing in the labor of purification the life essences, which, when turned upward, provide fuel for the ever-burning lamp within himself. So what does that mean? When you turn, so if you think about your lower three chakras, that would be the downward facing triangle, right? So that would be your solar plexus. If you start from the, the top of the, the lower three, that would be your um, solar plexus, your sacral chakra, and your root chakra. That forms that downward facing triangle. The upward facing triangle is your upper three chakras. And then you have the, you, when those two are combined, then you get the opening, you get the crown, okay? Which is, that that's the flame. The crown represents the flame, the thousand petal lotus that represents that flame. That's the kundalini energy. So what he's saying is that if you take the, 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 um, the lower three and you turn that upwards, right? then that's how you begin to raise your kundalini energy to ignite that flame in your higher chakra. Does that make sense, everybody? All right.
Upon the altars of the ancients were offered sacrifices to their gods. The ancient hierophant offered up sacrifices of spices and incense. The See, we don't call them sacrifices. You know what I'm saying? Those are offerings. And, you know, if you know, um, when we talk about sacrifices and things like that in the what's happening um, in, you know, in the elite circles, I'll just say that um, it's very um, arcane and it's misguided. And what, the, you know what I'm saying? True spirit doesn't need those type of sacrifices, right? Or blood and things of that nature. Um, you can, your sacrifices can just be, and it's not sacrifices, it's an offering, right? It's the same way that you would want to establish reciprocity in your real relationships in life. You can't just take in a relationship, you know what I'm saying? Whether it's a friendship, a family member, um, an intimate relationship, that element of reciprocity needs to be there. And it's no different when you're working with the spirits. Now, if you're working with some dark forces, that's the dark forces that need blood and that needs your soul and that needs those things. But if you're working with your ancestors and just different, you know, beings that are just aspects of yourself, you never need to sacrifice anything. You really don't. You just need to give them something the same way that because they're going to impart whatever you're asking for, whether it's knowledge or increase or abundance or whatever it is, you know. It's not a sacrifice. It is an offering. It's a difference. The Sonic Brother of today still has among his symbols the incense burner or censer. But few of the brothers recognize themselves in this symbol. Under such symbols as this, the ancients set forth the development of the individual. As the tiny spark burning among the incense cubes slowly consumes all, so the spiritual flame within man is slowly burning away and transmuting the base metals and properties within himself, offering up the essence thereof as the smoke upon the altar of divinity. It is said that King Solomon, when he completed his temple, offered bulls as a sacrifice to the Lord by burning them upon the temple altar. Those who believe in a harmless life wonder why so many references are made in the Bible to animal sacrifice. The student will realize that the animal sacrifices referred to are those of the celestial zodiac, and that when the ram or the bull was offered upon the altar, it represented the qualities in man which come through Aries, the celestial ram, and Taurus, the celestial bull. In other words, the initiate passing through his tests and purification is offering upon the altar of his own higher being the lower animal instincts and desires within himself. Among the Masonic brothers, we find also what is called the symbol of mortality. It consists of a spade, a coffin, and an open grave, while upon the coffin has been laid a sprig of acacia, or evergreen. In the picture, we see the spade of the grave digger, which has been considered the symbol of death for centuries. Let us take the spade that now digs our graves through the passions and emotions of life and use it to unearth the secret room far below the rubbish of the fallen temple of the human soul. Now he's talking about the subconscious mind. In the book of Thoth, that strange document which has descended to man at his present stage of evolution, as a deck of ordinary playing cards, we find a very wonderful symbolism. Of all the suits of cards, the spade is the only one in which all the court cards face away from the pip. On all the other kings and queens, the faces are looking at the little marker in the corner of the card, but in the spade suit, they look away from it. It is said that the spade has been taken from the acorn but the occult student has a different idea. He sees in the spade, which has for ages been the symbol of death, a certain part of his own anatomy. If you will turn again to the picture of the spade, you will note, if you have ever studied anatomy, that the gravedigger's spade is the spinal column, and the spade-shaped piece used on the deck of cards is nothing more or less than the sacrum bone. This damn 
Is this why black people are so fascinated with the space game? Y'all, come on, man. Are y'all picking this up? Like, this is a thing. It's like, it's talking about like when you have cosmic memory, right? You be doing things that you don't even know why you're doing because it's the memory is embedded into your genetic coding. So you don't even know why you love to play spades like that. I didn't know that, that the spades is the spade. And so y'all know that the tarot, even the whole divination system of the tarot came from the playing cards and those existed before the tarot itself. You know what I mean? So even the cards are a spiritual way. There's nothing that is unconnected in this life. Nothing whatsoever. I, I find that what he just said to be very, very interesting to me, especially because I'm a little fascinated with space. Cough, cough. AJ, don't judge me. <laughs> Bone forms the base of the spinal column and is also the head of the spear of the passion. Through it and the foramina, which pierce it, pass the roots of the spinal nerve, which are indeed the roots of the tree of life. Mm -hmm. This is the center through which are nourished and fed the lower vertebrae of the spine, the sacral and cockajeal bones that dig the graves for all created things. The that's why I said, so he's talking about the body, but that's why I said we're not supposed to be buried six feet under. You know what I'm saying? That's a whole ritual. He talked about that. He touched on it a little bit, but we're not supposed to be buried in, in the ground six feet. That's, you know, tethering yourself to this realm even after life through the bones because in the bones lies there's you know um remnants of your your dna that's left there so that all needs to be burned up through the flame you came through you came from the flame and from the flame you shall return from ashes to ashes from dust to dust so you know what i'm saying you don't rot in a grave you're supposed to get burned so that your soul and you know what i'm saying can be released from this earthly realm this point has been beautifully symbolized by the gravedigger's spade, which has been used by the brothers of many mystic organizations. The currents and forces working through these lower spinal nerves must be transmuted and lifted upward to feed the altar fire at the positive or upper end of the spine. The focusing of thought or emotion upon higher or lower things, as the case may be, determines where this life energy will be expended. If the lower emotions predominate, the flame upon the altar burns low and flickers out mm -hmm. because the forces which feed it have been concentrated upon the lower centers. But when altruism predominates, the lower forces are raised upward and pass through the purification which makes possible their use as fuel for the ever-burning lamp. Thus, we see why it was a great sin to let the lamp go out. For the pillar of flame, purified and prepared after the directions of the Most High, which hovered over the tabernacle, is the spiritual flame, which, hovering above man, lights his way wherever he may go. Mm -hmm. This is the light that has gone out. It is the candle that is hidden under the bushel. This is the true light that forever dispels the darkness of ignorance and uncertainty. Let the light shine forth through a purified body and a balanced mind, for this light is the life of our brother man. The sun of our solar system, that is, the spiritual sun behind the physical globe, is one of these flames. Its beginning was no greater than that of the flame in the human soul, but through the power of attraction and the transmutation of its ever-increasing energies, it has reached its present proportions. This flame in man is the light that shineth in darkness. It lights his way as no exterior light could do. This radiation from himself brings into view, one by one, the hidden things of cosmos and his ignorance is dispelled in the exact proportion as his light is spread. For the darkness of the unknown can only be displaced by light, and the greater the light, the farther back the darkness is driven. This flame is the lamp of the philosopher, which he carries through the dark passageways of life, and by whose light he walks among the stones and along the edge of the narrow cliff 
without fear. I just want to pause and say this real quick um, about the flame and the, the candle. I, I've always been drawn to candle magic. That's the first type of magic that I ever practiced um, when I was a teenager. Okay. And so that flame is a representation. That flame for me, you know, I can only give you my personal experience um, has always been an easy way for me to connect with spirit through the flame. Like if you look at the flame, the flame is active, right? When you burn a, t a certain type of a candle, um, now I'm not talking about, um, I'm not talking about like, you know, decorative, you know, or scented candles. I'm talking about spiritual candles that you put your intentions into. They don't have a scent. You know what I'm saying? They don't have any of that. Um, but you watch the flame. That's a whole another spiritual um, field where even to learn how to read the candle flames. I know how to do that. You guys all should know how to do that if you're practicing because the flame communicates with you. Sometimes when you're burning a, um, a candle, you will see the flame will split into two and they will start to fight each other or they will be in harmonious with, they're never in harmony with each other, to be honest with you. Um, you know, you will see a flame that's very high that's burned fast. You'll see a flame that's very low. Sometimes you'll get a candle and your flame, the candle won't even, the flame won't even start. Okay. So it's a lot to, everything has a lot to do with fire as much as it has to do with the other elements as well. Okay. But today we're focusing on the flame, but that flame is spirit is very, very powerful. That's why you should definitely be always doing candle magic. It's very, very powerful. Like I said, I personally have always tapped into and been drawn to the flame, to the candle magic, and I incorporate it into whatever type of magic I'm doing. The candle is always going to be there. And as a matter of fact, even when I'm not doing any rituals, I always keep a little white candle burning um, in my home somewhere. Okay. And, you know, just to keep that flame and that connection to the spirit realm. But though he gains all other things and has not this light within himself, he cannot know where he goes, he cannot watch his footsteps, and he cannot dispel his ignorance with the light of truth. Therefore, let each man tend the fire that burns upon his altar. Let him make that altar, his body, as beautiful and harmonious as possible, and let him also offer upon that altar the frankincense and myrrh, his thoughts and his deeds. You know what's so interesting? I did a consultation today. And in that consultation, I was telling my client to um, how to set up an altar and to put frankincense and myrrh. Um, so it's interesting that's, that's in this book because I told um, the person, I said, you know, a lot of times people want to use, you know, we use sage and we use the Palo Santo um, and those are very common and popular. But I told her, well, I told the person that... Um, you know, a lot of people sleep on frankincense and myrrh. It's very, very powerful. So I'm telling you guys that, you know, don't sleep on the frankincense and myrrh to burn through your house and also to put up on your altars, okay? As in the tabernacle, he offers all upon the altar of divinity. So let him, day by day, through the mastery of the lower emotions within himself, dispel the symbols of mortality, the coffin and the open grave. Let him realize that, no matter how crystallized or dead his life may be, the fact that he exists at all proves that the sprig of acacia, the promise of life and immortality, is present somewhere within himself. That even though the flame of life may appear faint or cold, if he will supply the fuel by his daily actions, he will kindle within himself once more the altar flame. And this, shining forth, will help his brother also to kindle a flame and make it a living sacrifice to the living God. The Sacred City of Shambhala in every mythology and legendary religion of the okay this is about to be fire i already know it y'all remember when i did that room you remember that room aj when i talked about we did a whole room on the inner earth um and shambhala yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely he about to get into it I, I can't wait to hear what he's gonna say the world there is one spot that is sacred above all others to the great ideal of that religion 
To the Norsemen, it was Valhalla, the city of the slain, built of the spears of heroes, where feasting and warfare were the order of the day. Here, the heroes fought all day and reveled by night. Each day they killed the wild boar and feasted on it, and the next day it came to life again. In the Northland, they tell us that Valhalla was high up on the top of the mountains and connected to the earth below by Bifrost, the Rainbow Bridge. Up and down this bridge the gods passed, and Odin, the All-Father, came down from Asgard, the city of the gods, to work and labor with mankind. Among the Greeks, Mount Olympus was held sacred, and here the gods are said to have lived high up on the top of a mountain. The Knights of the Holy Grail are said to have had their castle among the crags and peaks of Mount Salvart in northern Spain. In every religion of the world, there is a holy place. The Oriental Meru, Mount Moriah, and Mount Sinai, upon which the tablets of the law were given to man, are all symbols of one universal ideal. As each of these religions claimed a castle and a home among the clouds, so it is said that all the religions of the world have their headquarters in Shambhala, the sacred city in the Gobi Desert of Mongolia, the high place upon the polar mountain of the world. Among the Oriental peoples, there are wonderful legends of this sacred city where it is said the Great White Lodge, or Brotherhood, meets to carry on the government of world affairs. As the Aesir of Scandinavia were twelve in number, and Mount Olympus had twelve deities, so the Great White Brotherhood is said to have twelve members who meet in Shambhala. To who else has twelve disciples? Christ. So you see, even these um, myth mythologies are older than Christ. So this is how you know that this is not something that was um, literal. It was symbolic, the Christ, right? It was symbolic. But what he's not saying is, you know, that Shambhala is inside this inner earth. Okay, it's inside the earth. So who are these councils? Who are these beings that is living inside the earth? We know that they're not the same as us. They're not. But we think about, you know, they tell us about heaven and things like that. We think of something that's above, but a lot of the stuff is inside the earth. If you have not checked out that room, make sure you join the Patreon, um, and that will be on Patreon as well, okay? Direct the affairs of men. Editor's note. To direct the affairs of men. Mm -hmm. Man needs to direct their own affairs. In other texts, this Great White Brotherhood may also be referred to as the Great Brotherhood of Light, the Council of Light, the Masters of the Ancient Wisdom, or the Ascended Masters. Let me say something to you guys, right? Do you, you know, you know who you are. If You know what I'm saying? Do you have to go into the room and, and into any room and announce it? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think that when you just show up, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's pretty evident who, whoever you are, okay? So... The point I'm trying to make here is the people that call themselves the Brotherhoods of Light and having to create whole societies and stuff like that around it. This is where your secret societies are, you know, start from um, the illuminated ones. This is where you get the Illuminati. That's where it comes from. This is the flame that they're talking about. These are the Satanists or whatnot, because they say Satan was the light bearer, Lucifer, the light. I'm sorry, not Satan, but Lucifer was the light bearer, okay? These are the, the Illuminati's, right? But the thing is that each one of us inside can become illuminated. So when you form a group to say we are the illuminated ones, it's actually saying to me that you're not. You're trying to become that, but you're not that. Because if you were that, you would just be that and it would just be shown in your expression of how you show up, right? when you know i i can look around and see who got the light and who doesn't and they don't belong to any groups the people that are in those groups and in those you know societies that these councils or whatnot um you know they think that they have the light what they're considering light is knowledge um so they the acquisition of knowledge which is great 
that's fine. Not disputing that having knowledge is a form of light. The thing is that there are people that that have something that is innate. It's the difference between being a natural dancer versus being taught, you know what I'm saying, a learned skill versus just something that you were born with. It's a difference, okay? So when you're dealing with these illuminates, these societies of the illuminates, the societies of light, things of that nature, the Illuminati, this is something that they're trying to become. Hey, Lilith, um, this is something that they're trying to become. This is not something that they are because if you are, it's not stated, it's just exemplified. It just shows up. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to tell people, oh, look at me, I have really long hair. <laughs> people, you just show up with your long hair, right? So if you have that big spiritual body, you have that light, you know what I'm saying? You don't have to go around telling people, oh, I'm so kind. You know what I'm saying? Like you just be kind, you just be it. And so this is how you know that's a sham. This is something that they're trying to attain based upon something that they, knowledge that they acquired. So knowledge is light. For those of you who have the uh, original light, right? The full light, um, it's maybe dormant inside of you. Understand? It may be dormant, but it is yours and it's your intrinsic nature. It's not something that you have to join any society to become. It's something that you are that you just need to remember. Let's keep going. The belief is that there is a spiritual organization of ascended masters or mystics, men and women from all cultures robed in glowing white light that have risen from the earth into immortality and help guide the spiritual development of humanity in their forward evolution. Now, if y'all believe that shit, come on now, let's just be realistic. I understand the concept of the ascendant masters, but let's just, you know what I'm saying? Let's, can we just put this into application? I believe that we have that, that's an attainment that each one of us can have. There's not a certain group of ascendant masters like, you know, the Krishna or, you know, the Christ or, you know, the Buddha or whatever, because if that was the case, you know, it, okay, let me just say this first. That is an attainment of what each of us can become, right? Each one of us has to become the ascended master. That's when you have completely transformed from your physicality after death. That's something that happens in the afterlife, okay? But are they helping groups of people on the earth? If these ascended masters exist, where the fuck are they? Where are they? Because this world keeps tumbling further and further down the rabbit hole into chaos, right? And pandemonium. So, you know, where are they? This doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So it is more of, you can have an ascended master that guides over small groups of people, I believe, in a sense that, you know, maybe someone in your lineage that have made the transition, that has, you know, attained that, that can, you could tap into for assistance. I don't believe that because if that's the case, you know what I'm saying, Christians, Buddhas, Buddhists, you know what I'm saying? All these different groups of people that have these ascended masters, where the fuck are they? And how are they impacting the world? I need evidence. You, you understand what I'm saying? I don't need physical evidence of everything, but spiritually on the spirit realm, which I'm very much tapped into, there's nothing there. It's really all about us, you guys. It's all about us. So this still is a, a, a you know what I'm saying? Like a, a, a gateway, a pathway to get you to believe in something outside of yourself. So just be careful. That's a little trap right there. You can become an ascendant master, but thinking that there's ascendant masters out there trying to help you, there are, but they're not holy for everybody. You understand? It's something that you can tap into based upon, you know what I'm saying? Like the own spiritual work. Sorry, my phone. The own spiritual work that you guys are doing um, and you can tap into people that have, you know, elevated to that level of ascended masters, but they don't have no dominion over earth other than, other than the ones that we give them when we tap into our own personal ascended masters. Does that make sense, you guys, what I'm saying here? AJ, Lilith, Miss Banks? No, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's go. It is said that this center of universal religion descended upon the earth when the polar cap, which was the first part of the earth's surface to crystallize, 
became solid enough to support life. Science now knows that not only does the Earth have two motions, that of rotation upon its axis and revolution around the sun, but that it also has nine other motions, according to Flammarion, the French astronomer. One of these motions is that of the alternation of the poles. In other words, someday that part of the Earth's surface, which is now the North Pole, will become the South Pole. Ooh. And anything ringing any bells for anybody based upon the stuff that I've been talking about for a while? So this is um, up is down and down is up. This is the inversion. Okay, there's a movie called... Um, if, I don't know if Lena's an audience, but if if Lena, if you're down there, I want you to write this movie down. It's called Upside Down. We need to add that to the movie list for Patreon, okay? But Upside Down is a really good depiction of um, how everything in this world is inverted. And that is basically what we're living under now. Right is wrong and wrong is right, okay? And this has been this way for a very long time. You know, um, last year I discovered some um, information on the internet. I think maybe here through Clubhouse, I heard somebody mention it and then I went and watched a video or something where they were saying that even our maps are upside down, right? Oh yeah, I think it was through the flat earth rooms or something like that that led me down to look at that a little bit. And so where we say like N New York is up north and you know, I say Georgia or South Carolina, Florida is down south, that the south is actually the north and the north is actually the south. So basically the poles are flipped as well, okay? So that's what this brought to my mind when I heard him saying this just now. So let me rewind that just a tad and we're gonna listen again and keep going. Is that the alternation of the poles? In other words, someday that part of the earth's surface, which is now the North Pole, will become the South Pole. Mm. It is therefore said that the sacred city has left its central position and after much wandering is now located in Mongolia. Hmm. Those acquainted with the Mohammedan religion will see something of great interest in the annual pilgrimage to the Kaaba at Mecca, where thousands go to honor the stone of Abraham. Y'all know what that Kaaba is? That's that big black cube. And if you did, the, you know, listen to the room that I did on the Saturn cube matrix, um, the Kaaba is one of the things that I spoke about. It's that big black cube that they 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 go around it in a certain direction, okay, um, pulling down energy. So they'll a whole bunch of people walk around it. Um, I think in the to the right. I'm not sure. I think they go to the right, like clockwise. They walk around it clockwise, and but that's one of the the energy points that the Matrix has. You know, you'll find these cubes in different locations. That's just one of the most popular ones, the Kaaba. The great aerolite upon which Muhammad is said to have rested his foot. Old and young alike, some even carried, wind through desert sands and endure untold hardships, many coming from great distances, to visit the place they cherish and love. In India, we find many sacred places to which pilgrims go, even as the Templars in our Christian religion went to the sepulchre of Christ. Few see in this anything more than an outward symbol, but the mystic recognizes the great esoteric truth contained therein. The spiritual consciousness in man is a pilgrim on the way to Mecca. As this consciousness passes upward through the centers and nerves of the body, it is like the pilgrim climbing the heights of Mount Sinai or the knight of the Holy Grail returning to Mount Salvert. When the spinal fire of man starts on its upward journey, it stops at many shrines and visits many holy places. For, like the Masonic brother and his Jacob's Ladder, the way that leads to heaven is upward and inward. The spinal fire passes through the centers, or seed ground, of many great principles, and worships at the shrines of many divine essences within itself, it is eternally going upward, however, and finally it reaches the great desert. But only after pain and suffering and long labor does it cross that waste of sand. This is the Gethsemane of the higher man, 
But finally, the pilgrim crosses the sacred desert, and before him, in the heart of the lotus, rises the golden city, Shambhala. In the spreading of the bone between the eyes, called the frontal sinus, is the seat of the intellectual divinity in man. There, in a peculiar gaseous material, floats, or rather exists, or is, the fine essence which we know as the mental spirit. This is the lost city in the sacred desert, connected to the lower world by the rainbow bridge or the silver cord. And it Ooh, hoo, 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 hoo. He's dropping. Manly P. Hall always does. He's dropping. So when I told y'all about the rainbow bridge, and I said that you see all this, what he's talking about now is your body. Okay. So he's talking about the chakras. He's talking about the body. It's the same thing. They say it over and over again in all these different books, especially Manly P. Hall. He gets into it. Manly P. Hall was a 33rd degree Mason and he got into masonry for the knowledge, but he decided they killed him. You know what I'm saying? They literally killed him because he started writing all these books and putting out this knowledge of that was supposed to be in the inner circles of the society, the secret societies um, of the, he was a Rosicrucian um, and he was a 33 degree, 33 degree Mason. But when he's talking about, so yeah, he was not very popular in his time after he did this. He was considered like a, you know what I'm saying? Like a whistleblower, if you will. That's the best word I could think about for right yeah, for our current day age. So he basically was telling all the secrets and he wrote all these books and did all these lectures and eventually they got to him, okay? But when he's talking about this rainbow bridge, it's called the rainbow body, right? So the rainbow body, it represents all the colors that's in your chakras. Think about it, you guys, from the root chakra all the way up to the crown chakra. That are the, those are the colors of the rainbow. So even when you see the rainbow flag in the LGBTQ community, this is not a slide against the LGBT community. You know what I'm saying? Don't get in your feelings. This is just facts. This is just historical facts. So when they take the rainbow and they flip it upside down, that's a tether into the earth because they made your root chakra and they put it in the place of the crown chakra. Understand that because red does not belong at the top. The red represents the fire and the base of your spine and the purple represents your illumination of the fire. Okay. So when they take that and they twist it upside down, you will never achieve what's called the rainbow body. When you achieve the rainbow body, that means that all of your chakras are aligned. You have successfully raised your Kundalini energy. You a whole spiritual being out here, like for real, for real. Okay. That's why the chakra work is important. It's extremely important along your spiritual journey. So at the time of transition, that is your vehicle. It is your light body vehicle, light. Because why is it called a light body? Because that flame at the top of the purple, which represents your, um, your, your crown chakra, that becomes the flame. So that is what takes you back into your Godhood. You understand? So you representing a flag that slip upside down, you're never going to achieve your rainbow body. That is something that's designed. That's a soul taken mechanism and agenda. I don't care what your sexual orientation is. I don't. I'm just telling you based upon occult knowledge. And you hear him talking about this right in this book, the rainbow body. That's something that's very well known amongst all spiritual circles and different spiritual paradigms is understanding how to, because everything, like when you really get into deep occult and spirituality, it's not really about this earth. It's about what happens after, right? That's what it's about. So that's the rainbow by, let me rewind that from bars. Hold on. Spirit. This is the lost city in the sacred desert mm -hmm. connected to the lower world by the rainbow bridge. Connected to the lower world by the rainbow bridge, which he means is the rainbow body. Um, but also it's, it's considered a bridge. It's like, let's consider that the, the fourth dimension. Okay. Um, in the movie, what was it? Um, the one with Thor. Do you know the name of the one with Thor? The Marvel movie? Uh, yeah, I look at the Avengers. 
Anybody can anyone remember the name of the movie? I can't think of it right now. Um which one are you talking about? There's a series of them, but the um one, this are one. you talking about the Thor? You talking a second, let me look at that. I guess it's called Thor. <laughs> That's probably what it's just well, called. Well Thor starts out with Thor, but there's uh oh shit. There's Thor, Thor, the Dark World, Thor, Thor Randolph. Yes. Yeah, so it's and just Thor, Thor, Love and Thunder. Yeah, so it's just Thor then, okay. Um, so if one of the versions of Thor, Idris Elba played in it, his, his name was Hamdell. Remember, y'all remember Hamdell? If you watched it, and he was the guardian of that that rainbow bridge, nobody could come. So basically, this was the realm of the gods, and then they had the earth realm. So it's like he was basically, if you would say, like a a Papa Legba, right? That sits between the two worlds. And he guarded that rainbow bridge between the two fucking worlds. Okay. The more you know this information, the more you can decode reality. And so you won't be controlled by reality. You can control your own reality. That's why this is all important. And they do show it to you guys in the movies as well, too, and the TV shows and all of that. So let's continue. Or the silver cord. <laughs> that silver cord. So the rainbow bridge is like the silver cord. So I have already broken down to you guys as well about the silver cord. The silver cord is, is basically your spiritual cord. So like when you're born into this world, you, you have to get, um, you have an umbilical cord that connects you to your mother. Cause your mother is a representation of the divine spirit that, um, exists, right? The all the nothingness. That's what the woman is. That's why I'm telling y'all that the uncure, the un, the, the 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 great the all is a feminine energy because out of that's out of her comes creation something okay life comes out that way and so the same way that you are connected to your mother um, by your umbilical cord that has to be cut and then you basically come to this world as a human being when you are going into your dream space your dreamscape, they say if you are in a dream and you die in the dream that you die in real life. When you're floating, you go into all these different worlds in your dreams, you have a silver cord that is like a, you know what I'm saying? That is like a umbilical cord that keeps your, your, your spiritual body alive, the animation of you. So if that spiritual cord gets cut because you are in a dream and you have a traumatic instance in a dream, you fall off a cliff, you know how they used to say, if you dream that you're falling, if you ever hit the ground, that you won't, you won't. If you die in your dream, basically, you will die in the real world. Okay, that's what they say, and they've been saying that. I've been hearing that since I was a kid because a lot of us have had the experience of, um, they say the witch is riding your back. Um, now they call it sleep paralysis or whatnot. But you, you in the dream, and you're trying to wake up, and you're trying to talk, and you're moving your mouth, and no, no sound is coming out. You're trying to wake up, but you cannot. That's when you're over on the other side. And until the spirit comes back to the body, your body's just your body. If you've had that experience, God, put a 369 in the chat, y'all. Put 369 in the chat if you guys know what I'm talking about, right? So what happens is if that spiritual cord, the silver cord gets disconnected, the spirit is no longer in the body. Now, the spirit is different from the soul, but the body no longer exists because the body needs animation, okay? So when we're talking about this rainbow body, you know what I'm saying? I, I want you guys to know that beneath the what you cannot see of who you are in your physical makeup, there is so much more and you have a spiritual counterpart with its own mechanism, machinations as you do. The way that you have your arms, your legs, your 10 toes, you know, 10 fingers, you know what I'm saying? You, you have your two eyes, you have everything that you have as a physical being, there is a spiritual counterpart that you cannot see. You have a spiritual body that works right alongside with your physical body. This is the reason why when people have to, you know, get, um, you know, unfortunately, if they have a medical issue that they need to amputate a limb or they have an accident or something like that, it's called a phantom limb that still itches where, while there's nothing there for them to physically scratch. This is what we're talking about, the rainbow body, okay? And talking about this silver cord. So that silver cord is what keeps you connected here. But once that's gone, that spirit leaves the body and this body is dead. The body dies. 
because it doesn't have anything to animate it. But that's a different story from the soul. That's different. Let's keep going. Any <coughs> Anyone want to chime in? My throat's getting dry. I'm getting some water. <coughs> Anyone want to chime in? All right, let's keep going. It is to this point in himself that the aspirant is striving to rise. This is the sacred pilgrimage of the soul in which the individual, leaving the lower man and the world below, climbs upward into the higher man or higher world, the brain. This is the great pilgrimage to Shambhala. And as that great city is the center for the direction of our earth, so the corresponding great city in man is the center for his governmental system. When any other principle governs man, he is not attuned to his own higher self. And it is only when the gods, representing this higher principle, come down the rainbow bridge and labor with him, teaching him the arts and sciences, that he is truly receiving his divine birthright. In the Orient, the disciple looks forward with eager longing to the time when he will be allowed to worship before the gates of the sacred city when he shall see the initiates in silent conclave around the circular table of the zodiac, mm -hmm. when the veil of Isis shall be torn away and the cover lifted from the grail cup. Let the seeker remember that all these things must first happen within himself mm -hmm. before he can find them in the universe without. Hello? The twelve elder brothers within himself must first be reached and understood before those of the universe can be comprehended. If he would find the great initiates without, he must first find them within. If he would see that sacred city and the lotus blossom, he must first open that lotus within himself, which he does petal by petal when he purifies and attunes himself to the higher principles within. So when he's saying you must purify that um, with inside of yourself, petal by petal, he's speaking about the chakras again, you guys. The chakras are very important because each one of the chakras are represented by a flower uh, with so many different petals on it. So this is the root chakra has a petal, uh, I'm sorry, a flower with petals on it. And it goes all the way up to the crown chakra where you get a thousand petal lotus. When you add all these petals up together, they're equal to 144 petals, um, which is where you get the 144,000 from. They say only 144,000 are going to be saved. No, that's not true. That's a way for them to um, humanize, okay, um, a, a particular uh, spiritual principle. So if you have 144 petals of lotus, it multiplies into 144,000. And I have the 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 the, the, the uh, actual. Um, pictorial description of this, a representation of this in a, a year, like about two years ago, because I, I had to try to show it to somebody on this app because they would keep talking about, um, you know, this only 144,000 people going to be, uh, you know, um, saved and the rapture and all that. I'm like, it's all bullshit. That's, it's you, like you, those, the 144 is within inside of yourself, right? And that's actually a matrix code within itself. Okay, so when you put one, four, four together, what do you get? You get the number nine. That's the number of completion. That means you have achieved all of the alignments of the, 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 the seven major chakras that you have, okay? The lotus is the spinal column mm -hmm. with its roots deep in materiality and its blossom in the brain. Yes. Only when he sends nourishment and power upward can that lotus blossom within himself and its many petals give out their spiritual fragrance. May I will say this too. You know, the society that we live in nowadays is designed for you to stay rooted in your root chakra. Understand that. So I'm not saying that people shouldn't be twerking and doing this and doing that. You know what I'm saying? Whatever you do that is of a man of human nature, then do it. But there has to be balance, right? You cannot stay there. And so when you're stuck in root chakra activities, it's impossible for you to activate all 144 centers of those petals of all of your, you know what I'm saying? 
of all of your um, chakra centers. It's impossible for you to do that. So a lot of people be arguing, well, you know, she got it, you know, ooh, uh, you can't tell a woman this and you can't do this and blah, 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 blah. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, we're co-signing a culture that should not exist, especially when you're dealing with a black woman who is the creatrix, the creatrix of all things, you understand? So when you have her in her lowest form stuck in her root chakra, then it is going to be, imp it makes it difficult for each individual to rise because the masses are going to flock to that. And so now, you know, maybe 20 years ago, if you were born, you'd have been more modest about yourself. You know what I'm saying? Now, and so the, the modesty allows you to seek deeper aspects of your own being versus, you know what I'm saying, acting like an animal. Understand that sex is great. That's how life comes about. But when you're sexually putting yourself on display, right, then you're trapped in a lower dimension and it's a hell realm. You know what I'm saying? Nobody, I'm not supposed to go on the social media and see your coochie. I'm not supposed to be just watching a, a, a you know, a, a video award show or, or the Essence Music Festival, which I don't want to watch none of that stuff. But I'm not, no one is supposed to be watching that and seeing these private parts of yourself. This is a hell realm. And you see black women in particular being rooted in their chakra all about money. I'm getting to the bag, baby. I'm going to do anything. You know what I'm saying? That is a form of selling your soul. It is. I don't, you know, listen, you don't have to agree with me. I'm not being judgmental um, or anything like that. I'm just giving y'all the actual facts when it comes to being of a spiritual nature. I'm not saying to let people take spiritual advantage of you either and to have your ass in some type of a cult talking about some, they're going to do this and do that for you. You got to do this work for yourself, but just understand what each one of the chakras are, how they function and how to heal each one, how to bring each one into balance and how to address each one. So if you're only in the root chakra, then, you know what I'm saying? Yes, you're going to get money, do this, do that, or you're going to be feeling a lack of money. You know what I'm saying? However, but you need to also address the sacral chakra, you know what I'm saying, the solar plexus. You need to address your heart issue, your heart chakra, your throat chakra. You got to address them all. You understand? Because the thing is, the key that you want to achieve in this life is balance. So do the root chakra things, but don't let that be your main focal point. You know what I'm saying? Don't let the, you know, overly, oh, I love everybody. That's not even realistic. So understand how these chakras work and know how you should have balance amongst all of them to be able to um, become an initiate of the flame so that you can raise that energy. What the thing is, what we're seeing a lot of is an overproduction of that flame only in the root chakra. And that energy is going to burn up. It's going to burn up. And these people would get burnt out. I'm talking about all these female rappers, okay? Uh, and they're perpetuating this culture onto a lot of, you know, innocent black girls who probably got raised properly by their parents. But, you know, these people have influence in the world and they probably have a lot more influence than the parents have on their children. So that the children are turning to that. And this is, you know, it's not a good thing. So don't let yourself get sucked up into that bullshit and let it be twisted and turned into this is black culture because it's really not. When the blacks were in Africa and they were doing dances, they was calling down spirit. It's a difference between gyrating sexually to appease the lower nature versus by dancing to bring down spirit. It's two different things. So don't confuse those two things. Your consciousness be lifted upward through the tree of life within yourself until in the brain it blossoms forth as the lotus, which rises from the darkness of the lower world and lifts its flower to catch the rays of the sun. You will sometimes see strange little Chinese gods or Oriental Buddhas sitting on the blossom of a lotus. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you look carefully, you will find nearly all the Oriental gods are so depicted. This means that they have opened within themselves that spiritual consciousness, which they call the Kundalini. Mm -hmm. The little hats worn by the Hindu gods also are made to represent an inverted flower. And here, once more, like the rod of Aaron that budded, we see references made to the unfolding of the spiritual consciousness within. When the lotus blossom has reached maturity, it drops its seed, and from this seed, new plants are produced. 
Similarly, within the spiritual consciousness, when the soul plant is finished, its principles are released as seed and drop back into the sea of spirit. The buds on the rod of Aaron are the seven centers within yourself, which, when you develop their spiritual powers, shine out as centers of fire within your own being. The ancients have used flowers to symbolize these spinal centers, which, when they shine out, show that the dead stick cut from the tree of life has budded, or that the disciple has vivified the vortices of creative energy, the chakras along the spine. In the Western world, the lotus has been changed to the rose. The roses of the Rosicrucian, the roses of the Masonic degrees, and also those of the Order of the Garter in England all stand for the same thing, the awakening of spiritual consciousness and unfolding into full bloom the soul qualities of man. When man opens this bud within himself, he finds, like the golden pollen in the flower, this wonderful spiritual city, Shambhala, in the heart of the thousand-petaled lotus mm -hmm. of the brain. Mm -hmm. When this pilgrimage of his spiritual fire is accomplished, man is liberated from the top of the mountain as in the ascension of Christ. It is then that the spiritual man freed by his pilgrimage from the wheel of bondage, rises upward from the midst of his disciples, the convolutions of the brain, with that great cry of the initiate, which for ages has sounded through the mystery schools when the purified adept goes onward and upward to become a pillar in the temple of his God. With that last cry, the true mystery of Shambhala, the sacred city, is understood. The new master joins the ranks of those who, in white robes of purity, their own soul bodies, have sounded the eternal toxin, consumatum est. It is finished. Mm -hmm. The Mystery of the Alchemist There are few occult students today who have not heard of the alchemist but there are very few who know anything about the strange men who lived during the Middle Ages and concealed under chemical symbolism the story of the soul. At a time when to express a heretical religious thought was to court annihilation at the stake or wheel, the alchemists labored silently in underground caves and cellars to learn the mysteries of nature which the religious opinions of their day denied them the privilege of explaining. Let us picture the alchemist of old, deep in the study of natural lore. We find him among the test tubes and retorts of his hidden laboratory. Around him are massive tomes and manuscripts by ancient writers. He is a student of nature's mysteries and has devoted years, perhaps lives, to the work he loves. His hair has long since grayed with age. By the light of his little lamp, he reads slowly and with difficulty the strange symbols on the pages before him. His mind is concentrated upon one thing, and that is the finding of the philosopher's stone. With all the chemicals at his command and their various combinations thoroughly understood, he is laboring with his furnace and his burners to make out of the base metals the philosopher's gold. At last he finds the key and gives to the world the secret of Gilead's balm and the immortal stone. Salt, sulfur, and mercury are the answer to his quest. From them he makes the philosopher's stone. From them he extracts the elixir of life with their power he transmutes the base metals into gold. The world laughs at him, but he goes on in silence, actually doing the very things the world believes impossible. After many years of labor, he takes his little lamp and silently slips away into the great unknown. No one knows what he has done or the discoveries that he has made, but he, with his little lamp, still explores the mysteries of the universe. As the close of the 15th century enshrouded him with mystery, 
so the dawn of the 20th is crowning him with the glory of his just reward. For the world is beginning to realize the truths the alchemist knew and to marvel at the understanding which his years of labor had earned for him. Man has been an alchemist from the time when first he raised himself and with his long latent powers pronounced himself as human. Experiences are the chemicals of life with which the philosopher experiments. Nature is the great book whose secrets he seeks to understand through her own wondrous symbolism. His own spiritual flame is the lamp by which he reads and without which the printed pages mean nothing to him. His own body is the furnace in which he prepares the philosopher's stone. His senses and organs are the test tubes and incentive is the flame from the burner. Salt, sulfur, and mercury are the chemicals of his craft. According to the ancient philosophers, salt was of the earth, earthy. Sulfur was a fire which was spiritual, while mercury was only a messenger, like the winged Hermes of the Greeks, whose color is purple, which is the blending of the red and the blue, the blue of the spirit and the red of the body. The mystic realizes that he himself is the philosopher's stone and that this stone is made diamond-like when the salt and the sulfur, the spirit and the body, are united through mercury, the link of mind. Man is the incarnated principle of mind as the animal is the incarnated principle of emotion. Man stands with Okay, so earlier in the chap in the book, it basically when it was talking about the flame, which is this is the initiates of the flame. Um, oh, I think um, I might have gotten a call. You guys might have <laughs> missed a little bit. Um, not to worry, it's okay. Don't worry about it. You can go watch, listen to the book on YouTube. It's Initiates of the Flame by Manly P. Hall. But he talked about the two flames at the that you know um you know manifest at the top there's a red flame and a blue flame and so when those two flames become one that becomes a purple flame so if you think about the two serpentine like figures that intertwines itself along the base of your spine up to 33 vertebrae which is the 30 um the 32 the you know what I'm saying when the 32 but when you reach the 33rd degree it's called full enlightenment. So it's the 32 vertebrae, but then it's a, the, the 33rd represents your enlightenment. It turns into purple. So one um, stat, one side, one snake is red, one snake is blue. That's a different energy. So, so this is the, um, in, um, in um, I think it's, what's, what's the name? I can't think of the name of the, um, the magic system. I think it's not Ifa. It's from the Haitian pantheon, right? The Dambala, right? It's Dambala Wado and Aida Wado, right? It's a feminine energy and a masculine energy. So the red, <clears throat> the red and the blue represents the feminine and the masculine. So it's basically that uh, duality inside of you. But when it becomes a purple, that is the the union between those two, right? The oh, that's the ultimate illumination. So this is why Prince was so powerful because he was a purple one, you know what I'm saying? So that colorful, that color purple is very, very powerful as far as your consciousness is concerned. So I just wanted to kind of um, bring that back for those of you guys that weren't here at the beginning of the, when um, that part was covered and discussed already. So I just wanted to um, reiterate that when you have the, it's the same thing as the red pill and the blue pill. It just represents duality, okay? But when the red and the blue comes together, which is the masculine and the feminine, the duality and comes into one and we achieve oneness, that's what represented by the color violet or purple, okay? One foot on the heavens and the other on the earth. His higher being is lifted to the celestial spheres, but the lower ties him to terrestrial matter. The philosopher builds his sacred stone by harmonizing his spirit and his body. The hard knocks of life chip the stone away and facet it until it reflects light from a million different angles. The ultimate achievement is the philosopher's stone. The elixir of life is likewise the spirit fire. 
rather the fuel which nourishes that fire. And the changing of the base metals into gold is accomplished when he transmutes the base elements of the lower man into spiritual gold. This he does by study and love. Thus he is building within himself the lost panacea for the world's woe. The changing of base metals into gold can be called a literal fact, for the same chemical combination which produces spiritual gold will also produce physical gold. It is known that many of the ancient alchemists really did create the precious metal out of lead, alloy, etc. This was upon the principle that all things contain some part of everything else. In other words, every grain of sand or drop of water contains in some proportion every other element of the universe. Therefore, the alchemist did not try to make something from nothing, but rather to extract and build that which already was, knowing this to be the only reasonable course of procedure. Man can create nothing from nothing. He does, however, contain within himself, in potential energy, all things, and, like the alchemist with his metals, he is simply working with that which he already has. The living philosopher's stone is a very beautiful thing. Indeed, like the fire opal, it shines with a million different hues, ever changing with the mood of the wearer. The transmuting process whereby the spiritual essences, passing through the furnace of purification, radiate from the physical form as the soul body of gold and blue, is indeed a beautiful one. The Masons have among their symbols a five-pointed star with two clasped hands within it, and in that we have the mystery of the Philosopher's Stone. The clasped hands represent the united man, in which the higher and the lower are working for their mutual betterment by a cooperative rather than a competitive system. The five-pointed star is the soul body mm -hmm. born of this cooperation. The five-pointed star. So y'all don't have to take my word for it. The reason that I can say the things that I say um, and share the knowledge that I do share, I don't know everything, but what I do know and share it's because I have extracted it, a lot of it from the readings and the work that I have put in, um, as well as, you know, some of the things are not from books, it's just from um, activating through, the, you know, the study of, you know, different books and things like that, and just going into meditation and doing all the spiritual practices that I do, then some knowledge, a lot of it is also channeled, but you need a foundation, you need a beginning um, to be able to open up those centers in yourself. So, what he, you know, what he just talked about just now, wait, hold on, hold on one second. The five-pointed stars. Yes, the five-pointed star. You guys have heard me speak about this uh, many times, many, many times. So the, the which is the five-pointed star. So you have the five-pointed star and then you have the six-pointed star, okay? But the, the five-pointed star is really, if you look at yourself, you are the five-pointed star, right? So you have the four elements and then you have the, etheric the ether that's what the fifth element is is ether okay so you have the um fire air earth and water those are the four elements and then the fifth element is ether so that is that represents so if you think about your arms and your legs as the four the other four points of the star and then the fifth element being what is contained in in your body in your head like in your brain you know like that top part that would reach out into the etheric realm so you know, those um, comparisons, if you can always think about um, what is the spiritual nature of what is happening in physicality, it will help you so much to expand your knowledge um, and to know yourself even more, um, open up your spiritual centers to have and gain and receive more knowledge and, you know, be guided, or, you know, properly along your path. So this is important to know. This is why when you see the five-pointed star, it's not a... You know what I'm saying? It's not a, um, it's something that's evil. It's not it. And the six point to star, who that's a, that's a whole, that's another, you know, conversation. The soul body born of this cooperation. It is the living philosopher's stone more precious than all the jewels on earth. 
From it pour the rivers of life spoken of in the Bible. It is the star of the morning that heralds the dawn of mastery. The star of the morning, y'all got to listen. What is the star of the morning? The morning star is who? Lucifer. Okay? Lucifer. And the reward of those who follow in the footsteps of the ancient alchemist. We read from the ancient symbols that the alchemy of life produces in natural sequence all the states of progression explained in the writings of the alchemist until finally the sun and the moon are united as described in the hermetic marriage, mm -hmm. which is in truth, the marriage of the body and the spirit. So the hermetic marriage is called the chemical wedding. Okay. This is something that Alistair Crowley um, explored and, you know, developed a whole system around, although it's, you know, in its lowest form, but this is the true, it's, it's the alchemical wedding. It's called the also the chemist. He did a um they did like a um a real like a C or D movie. If if you're not in the underground occult, you probably never come across this and you have to look to find it. But I watched it. It's called the chemical wedding. But it's basically the alchemical marriage. It's the same thing. And so if you imagine, you know, um being in a body in Lemuria or just being as a spirit in Lemuria where the aspects of the masculine and feminine um, existed in one uh, when we fell and that separated into two. So this is what we're always, you know, as humans on the earth, um, striving to achieve again, but we look for it physically through, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not a bad thing. So it's not that it's anything bad, um, but it's just how we interpret life. And so we're looking for that in partners, right? And we're looking for that through sex because sex is a way of creation. And it's, it's you know, sexual energy is the most powerful energy on the planet outside of love, right? Um, so those, those are two most powerful energies on the planet. So when you come in together, the, al the chemical, the alchemical marriage is the union of the both half of the souls that has split into two into masculine and feminine so this is where you would get your not a soulmate but your twin flame okay and I, these are just modern terms these are not terms that were used in you know in the past but because we live in a modern world i'm using those terminologies to you know to try to um paint the right picture here so when you have you, what we're all striving for whether it's on a subconscious level is to find your other half. So, you know, let's say you cannot be your, you can't find your other half until you're a complete person. That is true. No one can complete you in that way. But on a spiritual level, you know, um, when those two come together, if that was the part of you that split from you, that is a true twin flame. So you, if you ever seen the movie, The Notebook, I know, yes, it's just fiction, okay? It's just Hollywood fiction. But I think it's a good depiction of what will be a twin flame. So when one died, the other one died right behind it. And so you'll hear of those things happening in real life where someone's been married for 30, 40 years. Um, you know, one spouse dies and very shortly after the other one, you know, transitions as well. Um, those are twin flames. OK. And so this is where you're talking about, um, you know, what he's speaking about now is that uh, they had a alchemical and even if they never studied any of this, it was just about the souls that were able to, they found each other and they were able to connect and they didn't have to know these things consciously. They just were able to still um, achieve that through love, right? That makes sense. Anybody come on the stage? Let me check this chat real quick. Okay. What's up, Z? I see you down there. Sovereign, Melissa. I see the squad. What's up, Jordan? <laughs> I see you squad down there. Y'all enjoying this room? If you're enjoying this room, put a three and six and nine. Three, six, nine. All my time. Listen, we're doing three, six, nine. That's going to be the unveiler's numbers. So y'all put a three, six, nine in the chat if you're enjoying this room before I continue. Okay, let's go. Let's go. Three, six, nine. Manifestation, meditation creation all of that that's our numbers you guys that's you heard it here first this is the unveilers code the three the six and the nine point blank period all right so y'all enjoying the room okay let's keep going you guys 
for their mutual development. This takes place in man when the heart and mind are joined in eternal union. It occurs when the positive and negative poles within are united. Mm -hmm. And from that union is made the philosopher's stone. Yes. So is the unit, and what is the positive? The positive is the male and the negative is the female, right? Because the female it receives and the positive plugs into. So when you take the the um the penis and put it into the vagina, it's like you put in a it's creating an electric current. It's like you put in a socket into the wall. So you know, even in electricity, you have male and you have female. This is all built upon higher spiritual principles at, at its lowest form. So even in the act of making love and you know being with other people and stuff like that that you know there's you know you creating a lot of electrical currents and a lot of things like that you're dealing with energies you're dealing with energy so i know a lot of people don't want to hear that because a lot of people like to share the energy with a lot of people so you know just you know hey just know the information and then you know move forward with it and no one is half the battle so do what you want to do but just those that's the science behind it for real and that's not emotional that's just the science we are the alchemists mm -hmm. who centuries ago carried on in secret our studies of the soul. Mm -hmm. We still have the same opportunity that we had then and even more. For now, we can state our opinions with little danger of personal injury. Now, keep in mind, this book was written in 1922. <laughs> okay. That was, what, 100 years ago. We're in 2023. Is my math mathing, y'all? I don't know. I'm not really good with math off the top of my head. I'm a spiritual person. I'm not a mathematician. 1922 to 2023. Is that a hundred years? I'm going to check the chat. Let me see. Let me see if my math is math. And is it math and Lilith? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> All right. So that's, this book was written a hundred years ago and a hundred years ago, he was saying, you know what I mean? That, that was modern. They can actually talk about it now. You know what I mean? So this, remember what was happening in the 1800s? All this stuff was being forbidden when the, even before then with, um, Con, you know, Constantine and when they was pushing the Bible on everybody and all that type of stuff, the Council of Nicaea, all that stuff was going on. So um, they basically shut down this type of knowledge. And a lot of people did have to go underground, even though it wasn't their knowledge, they was trying to push it forward. Um, and they got shut down. So this is 1922 when he, it was modern day for them. The modern alchemist thus has an opportunity that his ancient brother never had. In the contacts of daily life, he sees nature's experiments carried on. He sees the fusing of metals. And from the everyday book of life, through the process of analogy, he may study divinity. By the flame of life's experience, the steel of his spirit is tempered. As the moon and the zodiac touches off like a fuse the happenings of life, so his own desires and wishes touch off the powers of his soul. And these experiences may be transmuted into soul qualities when he has developed the eye which enables him to read the simplest of all books, everyday life. The alchemist of today does not study alone, hidden in caves and cellars. But as he pursues his work, it is seen that walls are built around him. For while, like the master of old, he is in the world, he is not of it. Right. As he progresses for So what does that even mean? Right? Because even the Bible says, right? I think, I mean, Christians be saying that, uh, be in the world, but not of the world. And so to me, the translation means that, um, you know, what I say all the time is learn to live in the matrix, but you got to have a spiritual life as well. So what they did was take spiritual life and make that into a religious life. Um, if you're not into a religious any, a religion anymore, just understand that, you know, you don't come and you don't go and shelter yourself off and you know, act like, you know, you got to have balance. You, you can't act like you don't want to go to the party, right? Or you don't want to buy something nice for yourself, right? Uh, whatever that looks like for you. It's not a judgment for you to do that, but it's the overindulgence of the matrix life that 
takes you out of balance with your spirituality. So I would say, you know, keep one foot in both worlds. So you should have as much um, interaction and involvement, um, you know, in the spirit realm as you do in the matrix. You should be able to swiftly move between two to the point where as you're even living your matrix life, your spirit life is just, it's just intertwined with it. You're having spiritual experiences right along with your matrix experiences, right? But that is a extremely, uh, well, I won't say extremely, but it does take some practice um, and living it and physically doing the things and making, you know, mistakes and whatnot, you know what I'm saying? To achieve the balance, you have to practice. You have to put, you have to have some spiritual practices um, and you do have to do the work. Um, but I can be in any matrix situation, any mundane situation, um, and invoke spirit and see the spiritual side happen all at the same time. And that's the best place that you want to be in because it gives you more, um, I guess, you know, internal power to govern, you know, what's taking place around you. It's not a fail safe, you know, thing because you're humans, you're going to have human experience, human emotions, um, the, the matrix pulling on you, things of that nature. So, you know, don't beat yourself up if, you know, that's not where you are. Um, you just need to just practice. And a part of that is, uh, you know, kind of like having detachment from the matrix and the matrix outcomes, right? And elevating yourself to know that the spiritual world is more powerful and that is where the you be begin to create from. So, you know, keep your foot, one foot in each world. You know, try to walk on both sides. Further in his work, the light of other people's advice and outside help grows weaker and weaker until finally he stands alone in darkness. Then comes the time that he must use his own lamp and the various experiments which he has theretofore carried on must be his only guide. Mm -hmm. he now, you see, listen, if anybody has been in a consultation with me or even, even just be in this rooms with me, I always say, I'm just a light, a path shower. That's it. I'm not your leader. Because I, and you have to do your own work. You understand? We have guides. I'm just a guide. You understand? And you will meet, I've met other guys along my path. I've met like an angels that just came for one moment and gave me a message and I never seen or heard from them again. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, I'm just a way shower because no one can do the work for you for yourself. Eventually, you're going to have to take the practices that you have learned and you're going to have to go into that darkness and you're going to have to become your own light. But it's so rewarding. That's the only path to enlightenment. Nobody can fix it for you. You know what I'm saying? You can't ask Jesus to fix it. You can't ask your pastor to fix it. You can't ask your mama, your grandmama. You can't ask me. You can't ask nobody. Eventually, you're going to have to go down that path. So don't delay. Just, you know what I'm saying? Just dive in. Get through the bullshit, you know what I'm saying, which is yourself and your own subconscious shit anyways. So just deal with it. Go through whatever you feel the discomfort is, um, and you will become a much better person, you know, for it. Um, the more we delay <clears throat> that inner work, life is going to throw some things at you that um, you would wish that you would have just gone and take a look at yourself by yourself, right? Because life, the, the further you don't do it, life is going to bring you the situations that you need um that will be very undesirable you understand so do the work guys just that's it do the work and become your own lamp in the in the darkness but you're going to eventually have to go into your own darkness must take the elixir of life which he has developed and with it fill the lamp of his spiritual consciousness holding that above his head he must walk into the unknown where if he has been a good and faithful servant, he will learn of the alchemy of divinity. Where now test tubes and bottles are his implements, then he will study worlds and globes, and as a silent watcher, learn from that divine one, the great alchemist of all the universe, the greatest alchemy of all, the creation of life, the maintenance of form, and the building of worlds. All right, you guys, I'm going to go ahead. I just looked at the clock. Um, I'm going to go ahead and um, stop the room right there for today. Um, we're about a little bit more than halfway through this um, to this book. It's 90 minutes, 
but I have paused a lot to do, do the breakdowns and the um, interpretations of what's taking place here. But I will come back and we will finish this off with part two. You know, I have a Patreon community where lots of people come there to get this exclusive content. So if you want to listen to this, if you came late or just want to tap into all of the other stuff that I have on Patreon, just click the link at the top, join the Patreon guys. We do lots of stuff on Patreon. Uh, we do lots of movie watching, decoding, and we just do a community building um, and lots of other amazing things. So you may want to go ahead and do that. Uh, also, you guys, I want to say um, my YouTube channel is about to be popping because I just recently got monetized. Woohoo! And uh, shout out to Lilith. Thank you so much, Lilith. I'm publicly letting everybody know that Lilith is the one that helped me. She took all, like, all of the, um, a lot of stuff that I did on Clubhouse and she um, edited them for me. She took out the things that would not be acceptable on YouTube. You know, she um, sat and had to listen to hours of each video because I did a lot of videos that were hours and hours and hours long. And, you know, and she edited them. She creates all of my um, graphics for me. She does all of those things, you know what I'm saying? So Lilith is extremely talented. Um, and without her, <clears throat> my YouTube channel would not be where it is because literally I did nothing but create the content on here. It was Lilith that transferred that content. And I really monetized my whole YouTube channel without ever creating one YouTube video. I did one <laughs> with Wayne Chandler because we were promoting um, uh, one of the workshops that we were doing together. But that's the only one that I actually ever made, okay? On my, without, the, you know, she just recycled the content that I already created. So we'll have more of that. But um, I am gonna be going live on YouTube. I don't wanna say it out loud because I'm like, ah, life be life in, but I would like to, by the end of this week, do my first live on YouTube. So guys, I would appreciate it if you guys click the link at the top and follow the YouTube channel. It's completely free. Um, make sure you subscribe and turn on the notification bell so we can build up our squad on YouTube as well. The, YouTube is gonna add a different layer to these presentations because you guys will be able to see um, visuals that I'm gonna be able to share. Sometimes you'll be able to see me, but I'm not going to promise y'all you're going to see me all the time because I don't like being in people's face like that. But you know what I'm saying? It's, it's going to do what it does, you know? So support the platform, you guys. Also, make sure you join the newsletter. I'm putting out monthly newsletters. I send out a lot of updates, you know, as far as things that's going to benefit you. Um, sometimes on Saturdays, about two or three times a month, I will do that. You know, um, nothing that I'm asking for anything, but it's just very beneficial to tap in and you get a free ebook. So just click the link at the top and where it says newsletter, you guys can just join that. You're gonna get a free download immediately on spirituality and money and how to balance those two things. Cause a lot of times we're taught that uh, if you know, to be spiritual, you're not supposed to have money and that is not true. Spirituality is abundance, right? Those two things are synchronistic. So those are just a few announcements you guys, but if you know, I hope you enjoyed today's room. I don't see anyone that wants to come on stage to discuss it but you know i appreciate you guys being here um you know i was gone for two weeks but i'm back y'all i've been working really hard putting some amazing things into place working on this retreat that i got coming up on the 25th i'm excited about all these things and i'm excited to be back as well so you know yeah guys um little did you want to chime in on anything thank you so much for all the support that you've given me over the last year I know, thank you. Um, I think we all should be helping get this knowledge out. You're awesome, and I appreciate you. So, and I can't wait for the retreat. Yay! <laughs> all right, you guys. So, um, that's it for today, and I will see you guys uh, tomorrow. And we're gonna finish up this book. Um, well, this, yeah, it's a, it's a it's a small book. So we got about thirty minutes left. But you see how that thirty that I only did. Well, that was 45 minutes that turned into like two and a half hours because of all of the commentary. But the commentary is necessary. It's, um, you know, um, I understand that when people read, I'm giving you guys like some shortcuts so that you can focus on some other things, right? So you can focus on other areas of your spiritual development. So if I can help you with, you know, put in a book, record, you know, do, you know plan it, helping to decode it. It's going to help you. So when you go pick up a book of your own, you know how to read it, how to look at it. When you go watch a movie, you know what to look for, how to do it. You know what I'm saying? Um, and you can, it just frees you up because we're at the, we're at a spiritual apex right now, you guys, you know what I'm saying? Everybody should be doing the spiritual work in a sense of each person that awakens, 
Um, each person that begins to raise their Kundalini energy, that as the book is talking about the initiates of the flame, the more that you are um, cultivating your soul, your rainbow body, you and become uncontrollable, you know what I'm saying, by the masses of the matrix, well, the elites of the matrix, I should say, you no longer are part of the masses. That is the, that's how we um, fight back. That's how we fight back. You understand? So it makes their mechanism, it doesn't matter how much media they have, it doesn't matter how much money they have, it doesn't matter how many machines they have, it doesn't matter how many weaponry they have. It doesn't matter how many influence they have. The spirit realm, this world would not exist without spirit. Anything that has physical manifestation has a spiritual counterpart and a spiritual beginning. Before it becomes physical, it has to be spiritual first, right? It has to be a thought form. So this is why they control our minds, right? Because they're getting you, all of us, right, that participate in this, to bring about the future and the present that they want to happen. So that happens when you believe in the things that they're saying, like you believe that you need to go get a job. You believe that you need to do this. You need to go to school. You need to do, you know, all these different things that they tell you that you need to do. These are all control mechanisms. So once you extract yourself from that state of beingness, that you don't need to actually be at this job. I'm not telling no one to quit their job. I'm not Beyonce, okay? This ain't breaking your soul. Do what you need to do. Do what you need to do until you don't need to do it anymore, okay? Do what you need to do, but also have a plan because when you can extract yourself from the matrix, that is you, that is actually a, a warrior technique. You understand? Because you are taking away their fuel. You're extracting your a resource, which is yourself. The human resource is the greatest resource on this earth above everything, whether it's gold or oil or iridium or whatever it is, okay? The most powerful resource on this earth is the soul. And so when they have you captivated in your mind, your body, your spirit, your soul, and all of that, then that is a form of enslavement. So when you elevate your mind, it is really freeing yourself, you know what I'm saying, from, from slavery. So, you know, continue to do the work, you guys. Um, continue to cultivate yourselves. <clears throat> and the more you awaken, right? You don't have to worry about saving the world. Just save yourself, be an example, and others will gravitate that are interested in what you're doing. And they'll come to you, you know, and you can help them in that way or not. Just don't worry about helping other people. Just help yourself. And if it's, you know, if it's in accordance with, to your spiritual pathway, to help others in that would just manifest for you um, without you even thinking about it, okay? So that is the greatest act that you can ever do to counteract, you know, the, the complete um, Armageddon that we're going through right now. So I don't want you to live in a spirit of fear. I don't want you to live in a spirit of lack. Um, I want you to feel very empowered and I'm, you know, lighting the path. I'm just a path lighter, a path shower, um, you know, you know, and so just take this information, take the extra step. You can go back, you can go listen to this. I told you exactly what the name of this um, was. It's the Flame, um, Initiates of the Flame by Manly P. Hollis on YouTube. It's 90 minutes and it's completely free. So you can go listen to this again. Um, and then you can go, you know, listen to the whole thing and you can come back tomorrow and hear the more breakdowns that I'm going to do for it. Okay. So, uh, with that being said, guys, you know, stay, you know, um, very powerful tap in, um, glad to be back and I will see you guys tomorrow. Hope you guys have a great rest of your night and thank you so much, um, for being here with us today. Bye. Thanks everyone so much for tuning in. Please be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. For full podcast episodes, don't forget to click the link in the description box. Bye, y'all.